we're four minutes early and do you want to like uh, uh you guys can chat uh this, this is valentin golev he's a programmer and a philosopher living in berlin this is ben miller he's a writer and activist and actually if you follow opera he writes opera reviews from berlin for new york times oh okay i don't read that the new is, york times very much though uh that is joao florencio a gender theorist from i never know how to say the name of your university but he's on a very convenient sabbatical to make a film and be in berlin and all this happens so he's just happy to be here you know he's just like a and that is Simon Reese, but that's not Simon Reese. So I know Simon, that's not Simon. And we also have Brunella with us right now. So I'm gonna just mute myself for a second. Okay. We're still a few I minutes early. Myself? So many guests here. Okay. Feel free to converse, I'll be back in a second. Okay. Uh, yeah, my name is Alan Feldman. Uh, I'm a political anthropologist. I specialize in critical war studies. My most recent book was Archives of the Insensible on uh, war, uh, dead memory, and what I call photopolitics, dealing with the war on terror, but also dealing with transitional justice. Um, and uh, previously in the 1990s, I was uh, someone who designed HIV AIDS intervention programs for uh, homeless people in New York City. So a lot of my frame of reference for what's going on now uh, goes back uh, to the, those experiences in the 1990s in New York, uh, actually doing street outreach and harm reduction interventions with uh, the unhoused. I think someone from here who can remember those days is Francis, who lived in New York in those years. So, yeah, I was part of the group that were, was giving out uh, illegal but free uh, syringes, you know, basically practicing what uh, was called harm reduction, you know, uh, kind of guerrilla street outreach that we were doing back in the 90s. So sorry to interrupt. Reza's with us and we're about two minutes away from the beginning. So we're just Reza, I, Reza and Brunella, you guys know each other, right? Because I learned about your, your research and your scholarship through Reza. And that's how we invited you to teach for us this semester. Reza curates our philosophy program. And Alan will be also teaching a seminar for us this, this semester or season called Guarding the Borders. Uh, ben already taught a sem seminar for us on queerness yeah. and labor last mine's semester. On, mine's on the biopolitical body. Uh, yes. And Joao has been a guest, guest lecturer in one or two of our previous seminars. And Francis is still refuses to do a seminar for us because he, he thinks that he's not ready yet, but we would love to have Francis teach for us as soon as he's ready. Nigel, you gotta tell us who you are because you know it's supposed to be Simon Reese. And, and... I know Nigel. Hi, hi, Joao, how are you? Um... I'm a human geographer, social scientist. I've been interested in viruses, viral agency, non-human agency for a few decades off and on. A uh, good friend of Simon Reese's, so that's why uh, I used his link. I hope oh, he's being awesome. included. So are you staying with him or he sent you? Uh, he sent me the connection. No problem. You know, Simon, Simon is a good friend of mine and Francis, He's from uh, New Zealand, but he lives in Vienna and he is the director of Cosmosco, Cosmosco Foundation. No, not Foundation, Cosmosco, Cosmosco uh, Art Fair, which is in a way works with the Cosmosco Foundation. Okay, anyways, Renzo's here too. Hello, Renzo. Oh my God, star studded room. Davor, Francis, everyone. So, okay, so I guess you can click live. We are live. We are live. Are we live also on Zoom? We are live on Zoom. Excellent. YouTube. Excellent. So I just want to like, introduce the program to those of you who are here and it's very nice to I mean we're all bored at home right so it's like but it's very nice that you made time and showed up some of you can do probably more productive work at home by writing or researching or writing or reading or I don't know if you're with a partner you can have sex much better than this but uh, for a lot of us none of those options are available so here we are uh, the program basically came out of the fact that uh, we have a lot of experience doing this online thing. In, in fact, the new center is, in, is almost an exclusively online educational platform. 
And uh, for those of you who don't know, we are in the process of hopefully working with some European universities and become degree granting, but I don't know how this crisis will affect the timeline that we had in a hope of getting there. Uh, from the very beginning, Reza Nagarestani has been with us, uh, an, um, a connected-based philosopher. Reza programs our philosophy program, and um, I program the art and curatorial. And our interdisciplinary program is basically, we both contribute to instructors joining us to teaching in our uh, uh, transdisciplinary program. Hello, David. Hello, Davor, everyone almost getting ready. And I just wanna say that tonight is not so much about uh, theorizing. Already there's been a backlash on the social media about, about people like Agamben and Badu and Bifo coming in and trying to like nail down what this is about. This is more about sort of like intellectuals after a film or a movie or an exhibition, kind of like holding a drink and having still interesting conversations, but not so much about like carving territory or like saying, I'm gonna tell you what this is about. It's also about us trying to create that space that we've lost, you know, the space of like talking to your friends around the table at the bar. So it's kind of like an experiment in creating that. And we wanna continue this on a weekly basis. So hopefully we can, our certificate students and our, some of our instructors can continue this. This can become a normal Wednesday five to seven kind of like thing. And we will basically do this on a weekly basis and we will watch the crisis as it develops. It's political ramifications, it's health ramifications, it's all sorts of. Another thing is because we are international, there are people here from all around the world and there are more people who will join from other corners of the world. So it will be interesting if people can tell us a little bit about also about your local situation, how this is playing out locally. For instance, Renzo, are you in Berlin or you're in Amsterdam? You have to un unmute yourself, sir. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, thanks for setting this all up. Do you hear me? Yes, I'm just, uh, yeah, I'm basically because you're the first person who's supposed to be sort of like talking. So I'm beginning with talking to you. Oh, really? Okay, good. Well, thanks for uh, inviting me for this. I'm, I'm, I hope it, 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 it works and that it will work for a long time, uh, as you say, every week. Uh, I, I'm in uh, Amsterdam um, uh, in my studio. Um, I'm, I'm, of course, constantly in touch with uh, the members of the Congolese Plantation Workers Art um, circle in, in Lusanga, a Unilever, former Unilever plantation in Congo, where, of course, the poison of uh, deforestation and capitalism and uh, all kinds of exploitative practices have been, has been going on for a century. Uh, indeed, some of the sculptures uh, CATPC members made uh, are directly dealing with that, with uh, the, one sculpture by Thomas Leiba is called A Poisonous Miracle, and they begged me not to come because I'm a white guy, I come from Europe. If I come, I'll bring the virus. Uh, so far on the countryside in Congo, there are no, uh, there's no cases known yet, but in Kinshasa it is spreading and mostly from the, let's say the embassy territory of Kinshasa, uh, the virus is also spreading. Um, luckily we set up the infrastructure a while ago already uh, for um, this group of plantation workers to make, uh, um, yeah, to buy back their own land basically um, through, uh, you know, making sculptures and other art pieces with which they make money. So that we, we set up the entire infrastructure for, th for them to participate, let's say, in global debates and to make money of participating in global debates with which to buy their own land, which is more relevant than ever, because of course deforestation has everything to do with this virus. So that's where I'm at. <laughs> so what, about, what about Amsterdam? Oh, Amsterdam, um, it's, yeah, there's like a, 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 a a slight lockdown as in many other places. Um, uh, hospitals aren't yet completely overwhelmed. I don't think there's a panic amongst the population. People are kind of cool about it. Um, I'm homeschooling my kids, which I find much better than sending them to school, uh, to be honest. Um, so we're, yeah, it, I, you know, I, I, I'm in the lucky situation that I don't feel ill in any way. So, um, so what I, about what about the art community in, in Netherlands and in Amsterdam, the, the internal conversation in, in particular in Dutch language, which is yeah. not available to us. So what is the take? Oh, people are very worried, of course, are very worried about uh, income, basically. You know, it's uh, uh, as elsewhere, museums are closed, all kinds of productions are closed. 
Um, there's, and of course, the Netherlands is a very wealthy country, which means there is uh, still taxpayers' money going funneled into art productions. Will this uphold in the next years? We don't know. Maybe this, uh, you, you warned us against, you know, theorizing too much. But of course, this can be a big push for all kinds of, um, you know, policy changes, including funding for the arts. So people are very, very worried about that. Yeah, well, based on the conversation I had with many people here also in Berlin, a lot of gigs are getting canceled. Yes. And a lot of even writing gigs, I was hearing from people in New York, the writing gigs are also getting canceled, even though that doesn't seem right, because you think writing, you don't need us like get together to share writing, you can still publish books or put stuff online. But there's, there's been a lot of cancellation. So it's yeah. really like, uh, and you know, for me, politically, I think we, especially if you, if you, if you remember, I was involved by with two other people in organizing the Artist for Bernie Sanders campaign, which a lot of you- Yes, around. of course. I was so happy to join them. Yes. So for us and our friends in DSA and friends in the campaign, the Bernie Sanders campaign, it's been about A, keeping the campaign alive, but maybe on a, on a, on a, like a back burner, but really translate a lot of virtues and values of democratic socialism into practical solutions that can be applied to the problem and propagate that. So people will go, we can't say people will go out, people can't go out, there's no demonstration. You can go protest right now. But people can basically have these, basically use these to demand this from their representatives or politicians and kind of like, you know, basically the, the, it's, about, it's about changing the overturn window to borrow from JP Caron's beautiful word. Uh, or not, not that he invented that, but like his use of the, the word overturn window. Like we, we basically have to change the public perception of what can be possible and what can be demanded in order to sort of like deal with this. Otherwise, all the money is going to go to airlines and corporations Certainly. and regular people, workers can't get anything out, right? So basically this is sort of like, but also, you know, you're an artist, right? What do you do in a moment where like art can't do anything? <laughs> Well, I kind of tend to disagree. I mean, for a long time, I realized art couldn't do anything. I thought the the, the, the existing infrastructures, the way I perceived them, at least, um, you, you know, my, my background is that I, I started working on these plantations in Congo some, um, I, I think it's now 16 years ago, and I was immediately completely overwhelmed with the fact that any art, any type of um, uh, artistic take, any type of artistic statement I could make on, uh, you know, uh, devastating poverty, impoverishment, I should say, on plantations was going to be neutralized by the art world in and of itself. You know, best case scenario, it would make an interesting film in a gallery in New York or Berlin, or even in Kinshasa or Nairobi or whatever, and it will have no impact on these plantations. That is a status, that has been the status quo for a very long time. I do not hear you. Um, Sorry, I'm saying, what yeah. can art do in this moment in, in parts of the world in which people are asked to not socialize, not go out? You know, this is, this is really like sort of like, any, like a, more of a deeper philosophical or existential crisis that I feel that like art, art can't really do anything in this moment, but maybe it can. So it would be great if, if some of the art, better artists than me in the room, and there's quite a few who can contemplate on this. But anyways, maybe we should try to introduce Brunella. Brunella, you're the next person, but like, I mean, I mean, you can, you can stay in and it's casual, right? I just want to like, a lot of people and, no, no, and there's so many people I want to hear. I want to hear. Yes. Brunella, do you want to like, uh... can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, well, thank you. Right. Thank you, Mohammed. I think that you're very right. Uh, we should, as intellectuals, uh, change our mind and try to be more practical. I doubt that we can, but in any case, what we can do is learning how to deal with uh, an ongoing situation and not with the past uh, giving us categories and uh, philosophical uh, uh, references that are fixed. Uh, I can't see you. Anyway, uh, now you, you hear me. Okay, uh, so uh, it's a good challenge for us to make the intellectual role more flexible, not practical, I doubt it. If I can allow myself, when, if Agamben says what he says, it, it can only damage. 
further, exactly because he expresses a 20th century attitude, critical thinking becoming paranoid and absolutely uh, parallel to reality, doesn't touch reality at all. Second, uh, uh, Renzo Martens, I have uh, a great admiration for his uh, Enjoy Poverty, and I show it uh, in my classes of aesthetics and contemporary philosophy, so I don't think it's useless. Uh, uh, it is spread all over the world in, <laughs> among my international students. So this is the intellectual role in this case, uh, uh, getting back to what uh, can be a seed being spread all over uh, the world globally, because exactly now this is what I, we can do now so easily. It, it, it seemed to be so difficult, but it's actually so easy to have a global coordination, uh, whether it is on the intellectual level, artistic level, or political level. Politicians now will have to coordinate. Johnson tried not to, he has to, and maybe Johnson was right. Maybe we need to have the virus, all of us, before it ends, but he had to coordinate globally. So my point uh, is, uh, uh, instead of seeing uh, the virus and thinking with this uh, added flexibility, instead of seeing the virus as uh, causing effects like uh, losing jobs, uh, making us uh, more virtual, uh, less real, etc., why don't we think of the virus as uh, anticipating, no, as uh, being the effector, the effector, this is what my course will be about, the cybernetic uh, trigger of uh, the possibility of anticipating consequences, not, not consequences, but emergences. If so we think causalistically, that is in the old fashion of the intellectuals, we only think of consequences. Let's think of emergences. What is going to emerge? More empathy, more distance, more focus on hospitals and jails, and factories. This is what intellectuals must do, projecting ourselves into future possibilities and not thinking of consequences. Now, you, you use the word cybernetic in this regard. It would be great if you if you open it up a little bit, but I really should let Reza talk to you because you guys speak of your own course, Of course, of course. Reza, feel free to, to, to interrogate her claims, basically. You have to unmute yourself. Oh, sorry. I don't see Reza. I yes. see. I, I was just saying that uh, I actually prefer at this point just to listen. I'm uh, kind of in complete agreement uh, on many points here. Great. This is strange. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, so so maybe because you, you know what I mean. We know we know cybernetics from other contexts, but like, how do you how do you consider this a cybernetic trigger? It would be interesting if you can. Expand on it. Uh, yes, cybernetics started in the 50s, uh, but and then it ended up. Uh, we don't know exactly why. But cybernetic has a very interesting notion, which is uh, the effector. The effector in cybernetic is made by a machine that uh, has a mechanism according to which uh, the increase of energy causes a decrease of energy. A decrease of energy causes an increase of energy. This is uh, common to so many activities like walking. When we walk, we constantly mo moderate our energy by going uh, in a, this bilateral uh, way. It is uh, present in our uh, toilet flush. It is present in fountains, uh, population growth. So uh, what is cybernetic in this virus? This virus uh, causes, uh, is itself an effector and not just the cause of effects, because it compels the people to think of uh, something new that was not uh, thinkable before. So what is this novelty? It is uh, the uh, necessity to focus and therefore to correct previous errors. Now in Italy, we have need for more doctors, but we had this need before the virus. So the virus ac activates or gives a positive feedback mm -hmm of the problems to be solved. It has been solved. Those doctors have been found. 
Why? Because of the emergency. Uh, United States, I have this uh, scenario, a futuristic or sci-fi uh, sci scenario that you are going to have a welfare state at last because it will be needed because it will be necessary. You can't go on like this. You must have Italy as a model, <laughs> paradoxically, because our welfare state it doesn't work very well, but it exists, okay? So if we lose jobs, if we are going to lose jobs, we can still go to hospitals for free. We can have schools for free, etc. cetera. So, so can we consider uh, Republic, the Republican idea that like maybe we should just let all the old people die rather than the stock market to die itself another kind of feedback loop. Uh, well, the Republic, I don't know if this is the Republic. This is one possible solution. It cannot be uh, politically uh, proposed because we cannot accept to have uh, our uh, old people die. Well, course. this was proposed yesterday and it was but, all over social media. Yes, but, but scientists may uh, have uh, advise the Johnson in England uh, in this sense, in the sense that this might be the only possible solution. And this is why it's interesting, because we do not know. We are taking these uh, safety measures until when? If in one month we go out again, the probability of the virus to go back are so high that maybe the what you call the Republican solution will be the only one. So this is interesting. Let's see what's going on. Let's see what's going on. We do not know. I, I like this period of time. I like this drama because at last we can say we do not know. I, I want to uh, uh, quote uh, Keynes who in response to uh, these uh, causalistic and uh, arrogance of politicians that uh, he used to say, well, actually was the answer in per se, he said, in the long run, we are all dead. That is, it's useless to uh, make uh, uh, solutions that, uh, are, that claim to uh, hold good forever. We do not know. At last, we, it's about time that we say, we do not know. David. David Orban, cybernetic and its prehistory is also your your territory. You yes. also just did a seminar for us, kind of like overlapping with Brunella's work. So I thought of asking you to maybe like maybe talk to Brunella, or maybe ask question or add to what Brunella had to say. Yes, uh, I my you know my specialty is in the sort of the, the first generation cyberneticists and the emphasis on. Uh, on homeostasis and, uh, and and functionalism, and I think that what we're seeing here um, um, is a certain um, a, a shock to the system. Um, because perhaps it's because I'm in New York City, but um, uh, what I'm not I'm not seeing the reactivity as far as the generation of doctors or things like that kicking into gear anywhere near enough. Rather, I. Uh, what my perception is that si the the desubjectification that cybernetics that cybernetics required to look at systems from uh, a deanthropomorphized deanthropomorphized whatever uh, uh, perspective, uh, and for all the uh, talk of decentering the subject that's come out in philosophy over the last uh, I don't know twenty to fifty years, depending on your time frame. Um, I think it's only really kicking into gear now because um, uh, to go back to the point that Georg Simmel made uh, over a hundred years ago in philosophy of money in particular, uh, it, it, you're, you're looking at, uh, at systems which, which fundamentally can only be grasped, uh, are, are too large to grasp except in uh, quantification. And that's why we've handed off so much of this work to uh, computers. And what we're seeing now is that um, you know the, the, these health decisions that normally are made uh, very quietly, these actuarial decisions that are made very quietly, are being pulled into the public sphere, and we don't even have a discourse for uh, for debating them. Such as you know, for example, how it, on the one hand, okay, what is the value of a human life versus the value of an economy? That one's a more loaded one, but let's take another one of who gets the ventilators. Uh, our governor, Andrew Cuomo, just said that there is no plan in place for who gets a ventilator, who gets priority on the ventilator. That is at least in part false. Uh, there are already ERs that are reporting 
that uh, people are being taken, uh, so-called feudal cases are being taken off uh, of ventilators. And we have to ask ourselves, well, how is it, how do we define what is a feudal case? How is it that we are deciding or doing the process of triage? And I think triage is probably a useful word because we're going to be seeing a lot of triage in the coming weeks. So by and feudal I guess case, you're talking about when a doctor has to decide which one of the patients has more of a chance of survival, so the ventilator right. goes to them, right? Right. A, or I mean, survival, or it doesn't necessarily even have to be survival. You could say this person is more important. We are going to try to save this person. Triage can take can take into account any factors, but when you run out of when you run out of <laughs> surplus, the when you run out of the monster surplus, uh, when, and we are seeing this in ventilators in particular, which is why I'm using it as an example. How is it that you make these decisions? And what we are seeing is a public discourse that cannot even entertain such an idea because on the one hand, uh, the sort of machinations of capital have become so omnipresent and so obscured that the um, the idea of numerical trade-offs has become simultaneously omnipresent and marginalized so that it cannot be applied in such a situation to, okay, how, how, how do we assess? The other danger is that these quantifications that are being made over people will result in general standards that A, the public do not, does not understand, and that B, are not even being applied correctly because there hasn't been enough preparation in place to say, well, you know, you are more valuable than this other person. You are more likely to live for this other person. We are seeing, you know, the administration aspect of healthcare. And I think that, again, this is the, it, it, extremely analogous to Zimmel's uh, philosophy of money being extended into the realm of health. No. Uh, and I wanted... To, Go ahead, Sorry, go ahead. I can keep going, but Leo, Mo, please take what it. What I was also going to say is that you've been making a lot of interesting posts about like the significance of statistics and computational modeling, <laughs> understanding this illness and its future. So maybe you want to also talk a little bit about that because this is actually one of the reasons me and Reza and Valentin thought this is good was like your post thinking like, oh my God, we should get David to yeah. talk about like computation and, and statistical modeling and its importance <laughs> to the illness. Our, our apperception of the, you know, I, I have been in the, uh, in the um, I've had the luxury, one might say, of experiencing the crisis uh, remotely and then locally. And the interesting thing is, is seeing how much that, it, how much it hasn't changed in terms of the crisis being mediated through the mechanism of statistics that, um, that on the, Classically speaking, we always have anecdotes that, you know, um, we need a Greta, Th who, who will be the Greta Thunberg of COVID? Who knows? But at the same time, um, you know, there isn't, uh, uh, because of the nature of an epidemic, because of the nature of a pandemic, no one, uh, the, the individual story loses the power to, at least among at least some significant part of the population, to, uh, to, to drive policy. And hence why you had, uh, what, is, what, is, what was the uh, hashtag flatten the curve, but a statistical maneuver, people attempting to, to present a vulgarized version of statistics. And I do not say this to, um, to delegitimize flatten the curve, but if you look at it, you know, it is an abstract argument. If you look at the Washington Post's uh, uh, pandemic simulator, contagion simulator, uh, which is apparently their most popular article of all time. And so I encourage you to try it, you know, no matter what you may think of the Washington Post or of the statistical approach, simply to see how the public discourse is being changed, because this is indeed what is shaping public policy. And while we all may, you know, wish that public policy were in the terms that we were, were phrased in the terms that we are talking about today, I find it good to be conversant with the uh, vulgar and depressing terms which uh, public policy is actually being debated in. And this sort of vulgar st statistification, statistic, what is, uh, I, I want to say quantification, but statistification would be more uh, accurate, except it's not a word. But this, this sort of, this, this vulgarization is how uh, policy is weaving its way through. Um, so 
the question is what from a I, I want to say we can look uh, one good antecedent here would be Husserl and the crisis of the U European sciences that I how are we to look at the um, historical development of statistics that uh, of statistics as it is entering the public mind now through a phenomenon such as flatten the curve. I can take another one, flatten the curve seems like a good one because I figure most of you have heard of it at this point, it got quite a bit of traction. Um, well, you know, it, it's worth looking- What's interesting to me is like this, this sort of like a quasi official website that they're like a, uh, you know, the one that's called Worldometer, right? It's the one that really made a lot of money i bet because they're the one that show up on top of the google when you search for yeah. for statistic for statistics for a corona and yes. they, they don't they say we're a group of people who private company who did this but somehow everyone's relying on their algorithms right now to tell us uh basically i call it all the olympics of uh, illness and death right you just yes. go to that chart and you compare the numbers of and the, the and the added ring sorry go ahead oh, go ahead go ahead no i made the a wrinkle to that is that these the, you know these the, this much of this data is still aggregated and it is apples and oranges what you're looking at is uh, all you know is pegs of many different shapes being pounded into the same holes one of the most uh, uh, concrete examples uh, you you in Italy uh, Brunella can correct me if I'm wrong here I believe that if you come in with a gunshot wound, uh, die of the gunshot wound and test positive for COVID, you will be die, you will be classified as a COVID death. Uh, is that is that correct, Brunella? See, I know what you mean. That is, uh, there are different statistical measurements. Uh, whether yeah. you you cover the coronavirus, uh, uh, however you die of something else. Uh, this is what you mean. Uh, yeah, yeah, that, that is, that is the, Italy. Now, Germany, I believe, is actually doing the opposite, or at least tending yes. in the opposite direction. Uh, uh -huh. uh, but th what happens is that the, it, is not, it is not even that you have these disparities, but that these disparities are then rolled up into, into uh, homogeneous aggregates. And uh, this homogeneity creates, I think, a virtual uh, cybernetic network that is, in fact, um, an inaccurate shadow of our world in which policy is being deployed in reaction to the shadow rather than in reaction to what one could conceive of as uh, uh, what, what perhaps would be the end, the, the, the accurate end of inquiry um, model of uh, the pandemic. And that I find to be a fascinating and somewhat disturbing topic in that uh, you, ha you have the, the, the statistics are themselves one one can we can we can debate statistical numeracy. People are certainly complaining about statistical numeracy, but in a way, um, the um, flatten the curve graph acts as a representation of what's actually going on at many levels. That 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 the data is being washed away. That the nuances are being washed away and combined to form a shadow. Uh, world of homogeneity. Is that clear? Is that is that clear, Mo? Yes, absolutely. Now, can I can I add it? Yes, yes. Go ahead. What I what I noticed is that uh, absolute numbers in those statistics they don't matter at all. Like yes, everyone understands they're slightly wrong, but the main argument about all of these policies is based on the idea that it's exponent. It, it doesn't like nobody cares if it's two deaths or two hundred deaths. Everyone assumes that it's just gonna. Yeah, it's just gonna grow. So I don't think I don't think anyone cares about cleanliness of data at all, as long as everyone believes that there's going to be this exponential growth. And one can look at that from the Bergsonian, Bergsonian or Whiteheadian perspective or process the perspective in that we are locked into this temporal temporal uh, into this temporal perception in that, well, obviously the curve is going to be an S curve because it cannot help but be an S curve at some point because it will run out of people, even if every all of us die. So, you know, when we talk about exponential growth, this is still only summar summarizing over a uh, over a temporarily limited time series. Uh, uh, and um, and that is what allows us to go from to, to go from the the world of um, of uh, arithmetic of our um, 
intuitive arithmetic perception, uh, perception of arithmetic increase to the uh, crisis freakout response of exponential increase and not be able to arbitrate between them in any, uh, in any sort of rational matter. Okay. Can I, can I add oh, sorry. Uh, just, just, just one sec, Brunella. You know, Antoine was moving today and I begged him to join us. I don't know how much time Antoine has and he has a lot of cool insight to drop in. Can you stay with us a little bit longer or do you want to talk now, Antoine? I moved yesterday, but, um, but yeah, I, I yes, really good. Stay. Because <laughs> if there's a few more minutes and then Ben is, Ben was, Ben was supposed to, to like take over the mic, but also Andre has a few things to say about cybernetics. So like, so like if, if maybe we should get Andre to say what he wanted to say and then, and then you, we can bring you in. Is that exactly sure. That's that's great. Um, I'm I'm going to take a turn. So let's. In yeah. fact, if there's other people who want to, if there's other people who want to continue the conversation in this direction, I'm happy to like hold back for a bit and let this happen. We're going to cover your direction too, sir. Okay, uh, Andre, do you want to? Uh, where did? Oh yeah, uh, Antoine, do you want to? Do you want to talk or or Andre? Do you want to talk? Either. Andre, Either. go ahead. Oh, uh, uh, okay. Hello, I'm Mohammed. Andre joining from... us from Moscow. Please tell us a little bit about the locality because actually yeah. Russia is like under a big dark iron curtain for us. Like it seems like nothing's going on there. Nobody's ill. No statistics are coming from Russia that much, right? <laughs> so what is the word on the street in Moscow? Yeah, but uh, hysteria just beginning because uh, two hours ago Putin uh, makes an appeal to the nation and uh, uh, the next uh, week uh, we can't uh, walk. It's uh, a declaration of some isolation. Uh, and uh, of course, there is no such historical moods like in, like in Europe. But in, in, in my opinion, it's very interesting because the reaction of co uh, cultural institution was uh, very fast and practically all the institution uh, were closed uh, two weeks ago. Uh, and now, for me, as a curator of big institution, but very flickering institution, I am curator of uh, VEC Foundation. We don't have uh, a venue. We are just opening a venue in September, and maybe the opening <laughs> dates uh, will postpone. But uh, we were thinking and uh, conceiving about how we are going to represent uh, our, our activity there online, because uh, because our our, uh, our institution, like Tretikovsky Gallery or Garage Museum just uh, began to do it and uh, it, it looks like very ridiculous sometimes but uh, uh, sometimes it's very interesting very interesting experience but uh, you know yeah, garage, garage looks like they had an advance notice that this is coming it just feels like they've been preparing to basically yeah. shut down the museum and roll out their online online platform i was just like wow these garage guys are so ready in moscow for yes. that yeah, but uh, Garage is a specific case. They don't have a collections and they just uh, an institution that uh, was collecting events uh, during their lifetime. So, and now they uh, have an opportunity to represent and to show it, uh, their, their collection, their archive of events. But uh, when I was thinking about uh, what will happen after this pandemic and especially during the pandemic situation, I was thinking about uh, Althusserian uh, uh, interest to the ideology. You remember, I'm confident that uh, he derived its uh, ideological apparatus and repressive apparatus as a uh, uh, core part of, inter of infrastructure in Marxist way. And uh, uh, concern a repressive infrastructure like uh, a police or army, now we have uh, a, a real agreement, a social agreement, because we are sitting at, uh, at home and we obey and, ev and everything. It's like a very love with government, with rep uh, repressive apparatus uh, of government. But with ideological apparatus, it's like, like a very cybernetic system. First of all, because uh, it's an interaction between uh, uh, different uh, actors uh, in that, uh, that can contains uh, that apparatus, like uh, uh, cultural sphere or educational sphere or, so, or something like this, and this connection very rhythmically. And some of the uh, traditional parts of the uh, ideological apparatus uh, uh, just uh, was deleted, uh, like uh, school or institution, because we can't uh, interact physically, you know? But uh, uh, or some uh, virtual uh, part of this apparatus appealing, and, and now it's, it will be very interesting because 
uh, we are in the beginning, in the starting of uh, a real uh, ideological war uh, from different uh, and different actors have been part of this war. So yeah, I, I think we, we should uh, start to do it and to find some new strategies how to uh, not uh, even resist some uh, uh, propagandistic thing, but how to create some uh, uh, interesting gesture concerning propagandistic or non-propagandistic concerning some ideological uh, construction or even some uh, 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 some you know some some process that uh, I would uh, baptize like uh, algorithmization of uh, uh, the ideology. Like ideological okay. algorithms. Well, you know, Antoine can say a lot about war and propaganda and, and algorithms. So why don't we bring in Antoine to just like continue on the direction and then we go to Ben. Hi. Um, yes, well, as you said, um, I, I did uh, move yesterday, uh, move home yesterday, which um, was rather an intense experience on the first day of the lockdown here in the UK. Uh, but we, but we did make oh, it. Also, um, maybe tell us a little bit about the the, the atmosphere around you. Also, it's like a strange atmosphere. atmosphere. I'm, not, I'm sure I'm sure it must be similar in other places. But walking around in London now is it feels like a strange video game where you've got to constantly walk around people, and and, uh, and everyone is eyeing them, eyeing everyone in strange ways. Uh, um, yeah, I walked past a strange scene actually, just as I, as I came I came here, where. Uh, Obviously, friends were celebrating each, uh, celebrating one's birthday, and they were standing outside of the house and sharing a glass of champagne about four meters away, and uh, it was quite a light-hearted scene. Uh, so people are, are, you know, trying to make the best of it. Uh, but but it is a strange atmosphere, and it's you know it's it's moved like everywhere very rapidly, and the the mood has changed you know, considerably over the last week or so, and I think more is to come. Um, I hear very on the topic. Yeah. Well, let me say some. I want to say something about triage first, because just just a brief note, because uh, you know David mentioned triage, and, and I think it is uh, an important term, and I, I agree. We're going to hear a lot more about it. Um, uh, you know, just hearing from my a good friend of mine in the NHS, you know, he's he's petrified about what's coming. Uh, they feel completely under-resourced. Um, they think the system is going to be completely overwhelmed. The doctors feel, uh, you know, completely unprotected in terms of their equipment. Um, and so how bad it, the breakdown in the health provision will be is difficult to tell yet, but, but you know, there could be a lot, it, it could be quite bad. And the triage is going to come in, which is to say there's going to have to be a prioritizing of, of patients. And triage is not a new practice. Of course, it's really merely the kind of rational allocation of limited res medical resources. Um, and, you know, in, typically, it was interesting from, certainly from my perspective is that it, it's kind of formalized in the context of war, because precisely on the battlefield medicine is obviously one of the most you know, constrained practices where you, you're likely to face huge casualties and uh, under very difficult conditions. And so beginning in the late 19th century, early 20th century, uh, the technique of triage emerged as a way to decide who would receive treatment uh, and who, who might not. And you know, in its basic form, the idea is triage is there to apply medical treatment to the patients it's gonna make the greatest difference to. So those who will probably survive regardless of whether they receive treatment or not are low priority. Those who will die, of course, these are all judgments you have to make on the, in a case-by-case -case basis, but those you think will probably not survive regardless of treatment are also low priority. And then you've got the kind of, those who will benefit from the treatment and, and, and who apply it. But even, you know, even in the context of the military, of course, that rationale of thinking merely about the medical outcome also then interfaces with other priorities. So for instance, um, it, it might have been common to practice sometimes what was called reverse triage, where you take the soldiers who are, who are actually very lightly wounded because the main idea is to get them patched up so they can go back to the front. So the, the, the triage or the medical profession then serves to um, support the, the war effort. And I think the analogies that are being made, made around the economy and so on is obviously uh, opposite here. One thing I'm kind of interested in, you know, musing about this the other day on social media is, is because it feels to me like quite a quite a unique moment in a sense. And I, and I was wondering whether we, we could really speak of this COVID-19 moment as as the first kind of planetary event. I mean, we've had like many, of course, 
events or, or of historical processes that have had a global remit, but one that's occurred in such with such speed and seems to touch every part of the world uh, in, in such a short time span seems quite incredible, particularly when it's not merely the kind of media experience of it, but actually the day-to-day -day lives of people around the world that have been completely uh, overhauled uh, almost almost overnight. And, and of course, this is ties to our kind of globalized condition. And I couldn't help, I can't help thinking that, you know, this might well be, you know, a sample of, uh, an example of Paul Virilio's integral accident he'd been warning about for a very long time. But this is what speed will do. Eventually we'll have a complete global accident that will affect everyone and every aspect of our lives. And financial crisis is was certainly kind of candidates for that. But the difference between the financial crisis, say, and, and, uh, and what's happening now is, you know, we lived through 2008 or we lived through 9-11 and these were shocking, maybe traumatic events. But for most of us, the next days were on a day to day basis, pretty much the same. You know, the not the economic effects of the financial crisis were, were you know, took took place over a, a stretch of time. The war on terror affected parts of the world. But for many people, these were fairly slow, uh, uh, you know, limited changes to their lives here in the space of you know a few weeks. We've seen many things we take for granted uh, kind of vanish. Um, so it seems to me a kind of a striking moment uh, in time where wherever we go around the world, we, we see people uh, uh, having to deal with this issue. Um, and moreover, this is a kind of, of course, there have been you know pandemics in the past, but pandemics in the past would have been experienced over a very long period of time. They would have spread. Uh, you know, across the world more slowly. And it would probably often be belatedly that we would understand that, oh, this was a pandemic, uh, this was a disease that affected many parts of the world. Here, we're experiencing all of this in real time in the sense that we are merely at the beginning of this thing. We haven't even felt the full brunt of this. And yet we are all perfectly aware or at least made aware of what uh, is coming to us. And this perhaps also accounts for the kind of homogeneity of, of responses I think has been commented about, um, commented on. There are minor differences, but broadly speaking, every state around the world is aligning itself uh, uh, in a large part on, on the kind of same sorts of responses. Antoine, I'm picking up something. It could be just like my, my 40 years of being subject to Islamic Republic paranoia, or I don't know, like going through so many of these crises, like from 9-11 forward, is like the tone of Donald Trump about this by, by insisting on calling it Chinese virus. And then basically, it seems like they're trying to militarize the discourse and both to use it as some like excuse himself in the upcoming elections and just say, hey, this was a Chinese problem. It, I'm doing my best to deal with it, but also maybe kind of like use it in the pivot against, pivot against China. And there's some kind of like, or, or you know what I mean? Basically encourage conspiracy theorists to even think that this was developed by China to bring down the American economy. That's why we need like old people to martyr themselves in order to save the economy because that's how we're going to beat back China. Like I just see these things developing. You know, I'm, I'm doing what, what Brunella was saying, kind of like modeling these like, these like uh, crazy stuff in order to hopefully get a more interesting conversation going. What do you think about this? Because you really have your eyes on these type of like war propaganda, war technologies, and this refusal of Trump to call it co coronavirus. And, co yeah. co and also there's been New York Times and other press about attacks on Chinese, Chinese people in America, like people being like chased out of like supermarkets yeah. and, and uh, yeah. drug stores for being Chinese, you know? Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, I think this is why the kind of the, the event is this this phenomenon is is two faced. On the one hand, you know, because of its planetary character and its the ubiquity, one might perhaps uh, an optimistic view would be that we might try to understand this event as as a, as an event that affects all humans uh, uh, equally, and, and in fact speaks to kind of the necessity for uh, uh, global cooperation. But in in reality, of course, you're right. We're seeing. I think there's definitely a geopolitics of coronavirus going on um there's there's uh, I, you know i wonder for instance whether the strategies you know the, whether they're not people thinking uh, in the us maybe in the uk uh, when the herd immunity strategy seems to be adopted we think well you know if we kind of play our cards right we come out of the other side of this the much stronger state you know if, if other states shut down their economy for six months 
uh, and uh, and we go through you know the coronavirus uh, in a, an accelerated fashion and we shed you know five percent or you know two percent of the population but we maintain the uh, you know our economy uh, then we stand a much stronger chance uh, a much strong and we find ourselves in a much strengthened position i think we have to take those kinds of calculations quite seriously because i think they may well be going on in the background well, china it seems to me is also waging a propaganda war i have no idea you know what is really going on on the ground in china but it seems that you know they're making a, a lot out of the fact that they've beaten it while you know the rest of the world is flailing about but there's no reason to believe that they've cracked it because most of the chinese population has not been infected and therefore is as vulnerable to uh, to infection as as the rest of the world as soon as it as it sparks up again well so, the thing you said about american economy the interesting is that when when donald trump got out of the nuclear deal with iran europe was supposed to like say no but we know whatever america does europe and the rest of the world will eventually sooner or later follow so if if trump decide to like take things back to normal even though people are dying europe and the rest of the world will have no chance but to follow right because that's the previous examples again i'm being cybernetic here right Pre previous examples feedback loop shows us that's how things worked out in the past so yes except i i i you know i think many others feel that way would be very concerned about what is going to happen in the united states um because the the potential for loss of life and civil disorder i think is huge uh so many people live on the uh, you know on the bread line and there's no safety net you know you, you there's the ingredients for, for 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 quite significant social breakdown i mean maybe those who those who live in the u.s might have a better sense of that or not but but i think it might be it might be a gamble that the u.s uh, government ends up brewing Ben, do you want to join? We're 15 minutes behind, but basically we're going to still try to like hold on to some form of structure here. And Ben is also American, even though he lives in Berlin. Yes. Hi. Am I hearable? Yes. Am I unmuted? Good. I would agree with all of these. Um, I would agree with what we just said about the United States, and it's, I think, especially tragic. There's a version of all of this where we're heading into um, what, is, what would obviously be a very uh, horrifying and difficult set of epidemiological and political questions, but doing so uh, with a kind of energized, um, uplifted left that was able to kind of occupy some of the political space that this is opening up. I mean, the Senate Republicans um, agreed yesterday for all of the for all of the talk about um, about the. Republican Party is a kind of death cult that's willing to sacrifice uh, your grandma to the line, you know, the, the line of the stock market. Um, they have actually been forced to agree to a package that contains things that outside of this context, you would never get even most, uh, most elected Democrats to agree on. Uh, instead, uh, though, we're heading into an election year uh, under the banner of this increasingly incoherent sort of aging Mao-like figure who's trying to insert himself into these various public conversations via um, very poorly run live stream events. I mean, we got this, you know, this was gotten together with whatever modicum of effort it was gotten together and all of the apparently smartest people in American politics can't figure out how to get Joe Biden to talk to the public. And of course, the reason is because it's not as much as they keep claiming it's a technical problem, it's not a technical problem. The problem is that he's losing it. Um, so th there's, I think, an additional um, an additional kind of sad element there, and I don't know what to. Um, what do you? Sorry, Ben. What do you mean yeah. with he's losing it? Can, can you? I mean, I, I mean, he's not. I mean, I think Biden is Biden is in addition to representing a politics um, that I think many of us would agree are well past their sell by date if they ever had uh, a good. If there ever was uh, a date when they were when they were useful, they're certainly past a date when they're I think compelling to anybody. Um, he's also just increasingly unable to make it to the end of a thought and still be in the same year subject verb tense that he was at the beginning. I mean, it's a like he's just very you know you you watch him um, give some interviews. Um, he did a sort of media availability day yesterday. He was skyping into all these different uh, television news programs. <coughs> Pardon me, um, and was 
you know, just breaking down in the middle of sentences, unable to remember what he was talking about, stammering, muttering, all of this stuff. I mean, it's really, it's really a very strange situation to be in, in which all of a sudden there's actually broad agreement um, on at least the need for emergency versions of some of these social democratic policies that that um, people were made fun of for for promoting, um, and yet uh, we're now going into an election in the United States in this, what is going to be, uh, it looks like a moment of potentially 30% unemployment. I mean, really unprecedented economic conditions. And yet there's no, um, and yet there is no um, coherent political argument being made. And that really scares me. Um, and it also really scares me in the United States context, the uh, potential, um, the space that that opens up. What is the political space being opened up right now in the United States? And I worry that the political space that's being opened up is a kind of Herrenvolk, blood and soil, white nationalist um, social democracy. Um, and I think that there are some political figures in the US like say Tom Cotton or Josh Hawley, uh, people you shouldn't wanna, you shouldn't Google if you wanna sleep at night, um, but who are important I think to keep an eye on who have the potential to be, if, as I think many of us expect, Biden does kind of squeak by in this election based on um, the difficulty of winning re-election amidst economic calamity, um, that would then be able to challenge uh, Biden from uh, the far right on questions of policing, on questions of immigration, on questions of uh, sort of social order, uh, but would uh, develop popular support for that by occupying a space of left politics that Biden's continued uh, domination of the Democratic Party um, makes it difficult for makes it difficult for the left to offer. Um, well, let me ask you a question. What do you think? Because, you know, like I, you, 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 you've also followed you have also uh, as a member of DSA and an active active member of like the the Ber Berlin Berlin for Bernie and all sorts of other activities on your own and separate. What do you think of the fact that they're retooling Bernie's campaign at this moment? He's going to like stay in the race and attend the May, uh, the, the pre May 2nd uh, debate. debate with Biden. And also like all the activities that he's been doing with AOC and Elon Omar and all that before we cut to Tiziana. I mean, I think it's an important, I think the strategic, um, I think the strategy there is good you can keep him in for another couple months and you can keep running these events um, and you can start to think about how you transform the network um, that's been created there into something that's potentially able to provide, whether it's mutual aid or um, organized political activity after the campaign. Um, and, you know, who knows, there's a, there's a non-zero chance that, that Biden just completely flames out somehow. I think a lot of us hoped it would happen at the most recent debate and it didn't. Um, oh, well, then, at, the know, time, know, at the same time, at the same time, it doesn't. At the same well, time, it doesn't. It doesn't replace. Um, at, at a certain point, you have to stop doing that, right? You can't carry that on forever. You can't carry on a 2020 presidential campaign forever, and I worry about what happens um, in a in a media conversation going into the fall, which is dominated only by Donald Trump and Joe Biden, which is really, I mean, it's like imperial decline. Uh, level stuff. Um, someone wrote in the chat that, uh, like Trump, Biden is a senile racist. Yes, I agree. Um, certainly, absolutely. Um, can I say one more thing before we yes, move on? Yes, of course, of course. Sure. I, as I just wanted to say that what, so I'm a historian, and um, my immediate thought when thinking about this was to try to think about and think about what its social effects might be was to look at histories of the 1918 flu of the so-called Spanish flu, which actually came from Kansas. And the reason it was called the Spanish flu is because the Spanish were neutral in World War I. And so that's where the first actually sort of reports of the disease came from. And this may end up being true of this virus as well. We don't, I mean, it was first detected in Wuhan. Um, <laughs> and what I've been trying, so I've, what I've basically been trying to do is there are really good and interesting and well-written and well-researched histories of the flu itself. Um, but what I've been looking for, because I'm not a historian of disease, I'm not a historian of medicine, um, is for histories that aren't histories of disease or histories of medicine that actually honestly grapple with what 
that meant and what it was and the size of that event and what effects it might have had on other um, on other events. And really, there isn't. There's almost nothing. It's very strange. Um, and I, I just can't think. Having lived through the past couple of weeks, I can't imagine assuming that the Spanish flu swept across the world and left nothing in its wake. Um, it d- doesn't make any sense. Um, and it doesn't make any sense that it ever made any sense to anybody. And yet it did because many very brilliant people wrote many very brilliant books and articles and did a lot of research that didn't center this event at all. You know, no one's history of 1918 ignores World War I. Many people's histories of 1918 ignore the Spanish flu or say, oh yes, and then 50 million people died. And then, oh, right. you know. Um, In Iran, Spanish flu killed almost 20% of the population, but, no yeah. one remembers reading a word about it in any history book. It's, in fact, it's completely Spanish ignored. Who came to Iran right between a regime change between the old Qajar monarchy and the Pahlavi monarchy, right there, because the coup had already taken place. Reza Shah, had, who wasn't a Shah yet, was the prime minister when all that happened, right? But there's no record of this in any of our written linear history of how this played into the coup or played into the regime change or whatever right i don't know maybe yeah. Rex knows more about this but i was very well, then, surprised to learn that 20 percent of iranians died of the spanish flu just like this one it really impacted the only thing that makes me happy i was like great maybe islamic republic is on its way out like the Qajar, but hopefully not to a military dictatorship which reza shah was kind of similar to yeah and 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 the point here is not to i guess the point that i wanted to make were two one that this that 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 people who don't only think about disease um, and epidemics probably think about disease and epidemics too little. Um, But also that many of the histories that think about this the least that I found, and I'm sure there are many things that I haven't found, are the histories that are the most self-consciously critical. Um, And so for me, it was a, a warning and a slap in the face, and I think a useful one, um, to just be very conscious of the profound degree of my own ignorance and blindness when looking and trying to examine phenomena, because one just has so little um, so little access to the totality uh, of anything. So it's for me, it's been a lesson in uh, humility. And uh, to conclude, I'll stop talking. Tiziana, thank you so much for being with us. And you, you're, you're, you're dialing in from, from Rome, right? If I'm not wrong. No, you're not in Rome right now. We can't hear you. Okay, go ahead. Very low, your voice is super low. We can't hear you. Okay, so why don't you figure out your figure out your uh, technology and maybe Katerina, do you want to go and switch sides while we figure out how to fix this problem with Tiziana? Sure, go ahead, unmute yourself, please. Okay, um, so should I present my location? Start yes. from you. We just heard about how the country is going to get into. Do- uh, marijuana production that was a news from that's no, from last year was it from last year sorry okay yeah but it's for medical purposes it's a legitimate industry so but i don't know enough about that uh well, in canada the prime minister last night made made marijuana businesses essential service for people so yeah but i don't know this is not that kind of marijuana so uh, as far as I know, who knows, uh, it may uh, turn out to be a whole different uh, uh, industry uh, soon uh, in the future, if there is any industry in the future and when there is a, a industry in the future. So we have no idea. So um, I've been living in the past uh, year uh, kind of, uh, between places, uh, part of the year in Paris, part, part, part of uh, the year here home in Skopje. 
uh, so this is uh, for those who do, do not have any idea where this tiny country is. It's one of the former Yugoslav republics. We're just north of Greece. So I'm located there. And uh, as one of the former Yugoslav republics, uh, of course, it's on the way of joining the European Union. So uh, it gives you kind of an idea of uh, the political context. Uh, unlike uh, the populisms we have uh, witnessed uh, further to the East, like in Russia or in Turkey, here we have this a uh, strange uh, combination of uh, populist, uh, soft authoritarian rule mixed or packed in uh, Euro talk and European integration uh, um, oriented policies. So kind of, it's kind of an Orbanesque. Uh, I'm refer referring to Viktor Orban uh political political background uh so uh and it's the predominant framework let's say uh the political culture uh, that is uh, dominating in the region uh and it's uh, far from uh, you know being uh, i'm not just making comparisons myself uh i should also state the fact that uh, Viktor Orban is, uh, in fact, uh, and his businessman and his uh, media moguls are uh, financing the right-wing parties in former Yugoslavia, so in North Macedonia, in Slovenia, uh, Croatia currently, and possibly in Serbia or already in Serbia, I think, as well. So uh, you can imagine the response of the state has been strong. Uh, liberal appeals have been uh, uh, always already silenced and people are um, uh, kind of uh, used to, in a way, accustomed to thinking in uh, the first person plural. And to a certain extent uh, that has been a positive thing, let's say. It has uh, helped the state, uh, the strong intervention of the state uh, with, uh, I would say socialist, to a certain degree, socialist measures like, you know, uh, universal um, basic, basic e uh, income for everyone, I don't know, covered healthcare for everyone, et cetera, et cetera. During the lockdown, uh, uh, it was first called self-confinement. Now it's a lockdown. Uh, so th this is how the situation has been developing. And let's say that there has been kind of a strong uh, control over the spreading of the virus. Uh, but uh, 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 proportionally with this uh, success in the control uh, in the control of the virus, there has been some kind of ecstatic exuberance of uh, increasing unnecessary and ever increasing state control over our movement, over our life, over, over the possibility to uh, maintain, nurture social connections. So the social connections are almost completely broken. We're, the time is, uh, we have a classical Second World War curfew where we cannot move at all for whatever need uh, after 9 p.m. in the evening until six uh, in the morning. Yeah, classical, like World War II. Uh, it's the same in Serbia, by the way. Uh, now it's gotten worse, so uh, the parts of the day where you can move are compartmentalized, so the young people can move until 12, no, or the old people until 11, then uh, younger than until after, uh, 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 younger than uh, 18 after 11, it's become crazy. So I'm, you know, uh, uh, stressing out now, I'm uh, completely, yeah, I'm angry and I do not 
uh, feel any need to protect either myself or my family from Corona anymore, because this is worse than uh, the virus. Uh, but okay, this is not. Um, what about what about the links with a climate catastrophe? And what about? Yeah, I wanted to talk about that. <laughs> okay, so uh, I didn't know. I want to turn this into a confession and how pissed off uh, I feel. <laughs> you know, I, I said today I'm going to become a Corona jihadist, and you know, just get the virus and infect everywhere. <laughs> that you know i will go in a completely anarchist reaction to all of this but that's me very for, agambinian right uh uh very agambinian right like a balance <laughs> so uh so that's the, far from that philosophically by the way she was <laughs> one of the earliest like super duper critiques of post-structuralism so i don't think we can like accuse her here of agambinianism but go ahead me no, <laughs> um, uh, uh, no. It's just uh, you know, it's it's not either or. It's uh, it's not either a liberalism and a Gambian critique of biopolitics uh, that would yield in you know classical liberal identitarian etc etc uh, 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 solutions to the problem or questions raised and the solutions to the problem, nor do we need uh, unnecessary disciplining of, um, of movement, uh, uh, especially because it's completely uh, non-creative. It's uh, paralyzing the, uh, the possibility of creating a discourse around this phenomenon. So, okay, let's, uh, let me, yeah, uh, move quickly and uh, wrap up with something which is uh, more useful to everybody than, you know, my personal confession. Um, uh, the point is, uh, the point that I wanted to raise and my problem, by the way, with Agamben and how Agamben misses the, the point with, with uh, his critique is, uh, is the following. Uh, I wonder whether the term biopolitics is applicable at all to what is happening right now. Biopolitics presupposes uh, the possibility of liberal values. Biopolitics is enabled only through subjectivization of the control of discipline. Um, uh, I do not think that we have this uh, possibility either in epistemic terms or in ontological terms anymore. Uh, why? Uh, biopolitics, uh, if, uh, if I'm correct uh, in understanding that Agamben follows Foucault slow, uh, closely and rigorously, uh, biopolitics is, as I said, uh, enacted through subjectivization. The subjectivization is enabled by the illusion of liberty and of free individual choice. And this illusion also implies the illusion of being an active agent, of actively contributing to the discourse and the disciplining effects of the ideologies that you are propagating. We are in a completely opposite situation. We are passive, we are asked to be passive, immobile, and we are asked to be unable to produ produce any kind of discourse, any kind of language around this phenomenon. The phenomenon we are facing is the threat of this virus. It's uh, the threat of uh, the possibility of our own individual death and the death of the closed one, uh, closed ones, uh, and closed ones. Yeah, uh, a good slip. Uh, so uh, we are in this completely passive uh, position of. Uh, protecting ourselves and the uh, close ones 
So we do not interact with the older ones. Uh, they do not mix with the the, uh, the, uh, the oldest ones. Do not mix with the younger one, or youngest ones, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All the stratification of social severing of ties is in order to preserve our lives and the, li the lives of uh, our close uh, friends, uh, family, etc. So we submit to this because we want to stay in life. And that's it. So how is it possible to create a political discourse around this? This is, if what we are facing is threat of death and we are merely passively protecting ourselves through disciplines from this threat, then we're facing the real itself and if this virus, this absurd thing, a virus and the issuing death from this, if this is the only thing that we can talk about, how the hell are we going to create language around it? So, so I, let me just let me just ask you something. Don't you think the subjectivization of, of classic biopolitics has somehow moved into like all of our freedom on the social media and the, and the virtual space to enact that while physically we're back into the disciplinary order, but our, our social media selves are doing the sub subjectivization of the Foucauldian biopolitics. Uh, well, uh, this is also another thing which is interesting that uh, Agamben is missing that also this does not work. I think that this is uh, this is something that is supposed to happen, but uh, considering that in the social media we do not say anything but uh, stay at home, protect yourself, protect the others, wash your hands, stay at home, stay at home, survive at home, survive the confinement, confinement, survive. Uh, uh, okay, do not go mad. Just stay at home and try to you know go through this. And uh, there is this repetitive, repetitiveness of imperatives to face the threat. So even in the social media, I do not see anything interesting. And the only photo I see is a photo of virus of a, you know, a, a tool figure of, you know, the, uh, uh, my, if you guys want to like uh, uh, times what what katharina's saying feel free to I'm, I'm just trying to like make it more of a dialogue but if you disagree or you want to add to it feel free to unmute and join because you know there's a lot of people who have an opinion about this around this room and i'm okay. just actually a curator artist i'm trying to learn and put things together mm -hmm. okay uh i want to add something positive <laughs> about this whole thing uh, Go ahead. The only thing that, uh, you know, renders me an active subject in this process is the constant thinking that this situation shows us that our uh, economy can dis, uh, decelerate, that capitalism can decelerate, that it can happen thanks to the uh, thrust the intrusion of something completely absurd again that would be in Lacanian terms the uh, t uh, terms the real and can uh, just stop spinning uh, halt uh, almost almost completely and we're still alive uh, but this uh, uh, this reveals another truth that economy including neoliberal economy, has always been a political economy. There is nothing elemental, unstoppable, uh, quasi-natural uh, 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 about the economy, the global economy, neoliberal economy, whatever. It's, uh, it's a political economy, as Marx has taught us, and it proves to be uh, one because with uh, almost planetarily uniform response of social of uh, government intervention, 
production has been stopped, has been put under control. Now the mean corporations are not so all powerful, which reveals the fact that you know the states have always already been complicit with the capital. There has never been the good Obama administration and the vicious capitalists. It's you know the, the two sides of the same coin. So uh, that's one revelation uh, then that survival with this decelerated economic production is uh, possible. That's another uh, revelation which is um, empowering one. Uh, but coming uh, going back to my uh, initial frustration, uh, we need to become active political subjects and confinement and discipline in order to save ourselves from the virus is not going to help us benefit from these realizations that uh, I just uh, stated we're witnessing. And one more thing, the nature and the animals are taking break from us, which is also another positive thing. Uh, but all of these uh, positive realizations, all of these possibilities uh, that should somehow lead to some kind of a new concept of seizing the means of production uh, is not going to happen if we remain passive instead of active agents. So uh, I'll stop here because I'll go on forever if I don't stop now. Well, Tiziana, <laughs> do, you want to, do you want to take it from there? Can you hear me now? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Uh, well, I am uh, speaking from Naples, uh, which is uh, in southern Italy, uh, the kind of kind of a capital of the south. So we are on our fifteenth day of lockdown, so we've been. Uh, I cannot hear you, Mohammed. You That's that? okay. I actually mute myself to basically do a little bit of work around uh, the 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 upcoming guest and stuff. So I apologize, but I'm totally like hearing you. Okay. So this is the 15th day of lockdown. So we've been living under the conditions uh, that were mentioned before. Uh, we are allowed, we have been allowed to go out only for essential uh, business, such as uh, shopping for food um, and possibly nearby. So we are not allowed to go shopping far away from where we live. We have to carry a document uh, where we state uh, where we go every time we go out. And uh, there's uh, police uh, everywhere, the army as well, and traffic uh, warden uh, kind of asking for these documents uh, and registering. Uh, people are talking all the time. There is a really intense communication going on by all uh, kind of social media platform and messaging apps. I, while we do this, at the same time, we're kind of uh, teaching regularly through all kinds of digital platforms. So, so there's been an acceleration of the move towards online teaching. And uh, all the universities are kind of asking people to, and schools as well, are asking people to move on uh, online and tools very quickly. Uh, there's something strange why, while we do this, you know, um, of course, you know, we are kind of taking this in different ways. So we're, you know, many of us are like also finding time to study. So I'm still going back to this uh, 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 interest I have uh, in this return of the social, you know, that was announced uh, at the end of at the turn of the 2010s uh, and uh, looking back at the arguments about the nature of the social as a secular abstraction in Mary Poovey or Nicholas Ross argument about the social as a plane of action uh, over the co collective being, which was supposed to have gone into decline by the late 70s uh, with various uh, kind of people writing about it and uh, Deleuze also writing about it in his introduction to Don Celo, the policing of families. And it's interesting, this tension between the social as a secular abstraction, which is a result of uh, the uh, application of the kind of scientific rationality uh, to the turning of the social into a knowable object. So which could be made real uh, by the means of statistics, uh, which has been mentioned, uh, and also the social as a kind of uh, uh, plane of territorialization and how this has been mobilized uh, by this crisis. So over here, all uh, kind of, um, Nicholas Ross argument is that the social was so tied to the national space, right? To the homogeneous national space, as well as socialism, which was state socialism and national state socialism, 
that it did not survive uh, market globalization, where you know the nation was not the economic unity that it used to be. It kind of got fragmented into several zones. And what you're seeing now in terms of relation to space and specialization, it's really a weird scrambling and reconfiguration of all spatial scales. So on the one hand, you have kind of Italy, which is at the forefront of the epidemics or the pandemics at a global scale. So it's like Italy, everybody's like three days behind Italy, four days behind, uh, two weeks behind. Uh, so we have become this kind of the forefront of, of, of this. Uh, and uh, we are being asked uh, to find national cohesion uh, as a nation to kind of answer to these epidemics. At the same time, the internal borders are proliferating. So it's become like crossing into another state, going from region to region. You cannot uh, cross from, uh, you know, we started with trains from Northern Italy to Southern Italy, which were stopped uh, because of the first wave of uh, students and migrants uh, from Southern Italy rushing back as soon as the news of uh, uh, the area around Milan being turned into a red uh, area started. So that was the first kind of uh, uh, internal line of fracture between the, the nation, between the North and the South, where trains stopped. Uh, and, and now it's uh, like regional governments have taken over. So, you know, you cannot cross into another region. And the next step was you cannot move. So you could move if you could show that you had, uh, you were returning home at some point. So it to show that you were returning home. Uh, but now it doesn't matter. You have to stay where you are. So you cannot leave the place where you are. are you, you, you have to stay in whatever place you are and you cannot move elsewhere. So the kind of the, the, at the same time, you're in this global space of pandemics where you, know, you get Chinese and, and Cuban doctors, socialist doctors turning up as the good guys, kind of helping the Italian in difficulties. You get packages from China, from China with love. Right from Russia with love, so this is three strange scrambling of global uh, uh, lines, and um, yeah, so you know, kind of a strange thing. The social, which was used to be linked to a nation and to the line with the nation, is exploding all over the place. At the same time, data analysis, like statistics, is becoming like weather forecast. Like we are dependent, six o'clock now has become a, a kind of a really important time during the day because that's a time when you get your statistics. So you get you get to know what happened. And since yesterday, we are all waiting for the peak of the of the epidemics. Uh, so we know it's, this is the third day where numbers have declined. So the, the exponential uh, curve that everybody is talking about, you know, has become a kind of a, reference point so we started to curve so it looks like we're gonna we're gonna see uh, uh, the the end of this uh, or we are gonna we're moving somewhere but at the same time the rest of the world especially USA and Spain is going up so what's our relationship what does it mean for Italy to be over the the peak of the epidemics while the rest of the world is climbing up again this is relationship between different uh, spatial scales uh, which is becoming strange. At the well, same it's a, time, but it's basically what we're seeing is the the peak of the academic in like known large clusters, right? It's not like it's not like everyone got exposed to the virus and now it's going down. It's like in in these particular clusters where it was very active, we've reaching the peak, right? All of I mean the the, the statistics. That's another question because you have a level where statistics are just getting communicated in these daily bulletins at six p.m. And uh, what the emphasis is just on, uh, you know, whether they are increasing or decreasing. And then you got this whole kind of undergrowth of statistical and data analysis so on uh, Facebook groups uh, and uh, YouTube channels, uh, which then have been picked up by national newspapers uh, with physicists uh, and data scientists and computational analysis going on, where these data are being analyzed and kind of broken down in ways that show the kind of differences and also the, the problematic nature of this data in as much as uh, again you know it was mentioned before it really depends on how or now they've been collected so who dies who really dies because of the coronavirus how many people are really infected 
there is not so much a passivity of political uh, um, dialogue uh, around this, but already uh, campaigns have started through uh, Facebook uh, uh, pages, uh, such as uh, uh, campaigns to get more testing done, because the approach of the Italian government has been just, uh, you know, social distancing, stay home. Uh, but uh, now we're talking about, you know, getting more more tests to be, you know, being better able to identify uh, clusters. So there's a data politics uh, is very much being discussed, you know, about how you interpret the data and uh, uh, how you get data. And that's going to start. Uh, we after two weeks, we are starting to get a bit of a political debate about the treatment of the of the epidemics, but also about how we're going to get out of it from the political point of view economic especially so today you start seeing the people uh, economists taking positions so you had uh, uh, the the kind of uh, the capitalist side the the, the factory owners uh, who are uh, kind of looking forward to opening again there have been strikes all over the country you know because the the factories have been have remained open so most shops have closed, but most factories have remained open. So exposing workers uh, to uh, the virus. Uh, nursing homes have been, uh, you know, again, uh, centers of, of the epidemics. A whole generation has been slaughtered. Kind of, we are losing a generation. So let, and me also your, let, me, let me go back to your, pro to your proposed sort of like uh, topic. So I'm I'm a bit of a pessimist. I usually think I usually think of these types of natural disasters as, as inherently right wing, or they have a propensity to sort of like move us to the right of the political spectrum rather than the left. L left political spectrum usually comes out of kind of like having too much resources or opulence or let people think more broadly, right? So how do you think it's possible to turn this around and use this to basically develop new ideas of socialism? Because that's yes, sort of I like the hope, right? Not, uh, it's definitely, you know, that's definitely not the case uh, that, you know, the epidemics, as you said, is going to kind of swing us to the left. But it is a, a, an opportunity to elaborate uh, a, an idea of, of the social, maybe, which used to be the ground of socialist politics, which is not uh, uh, something that is grounded in the idea of the nation but which is something that is able to take uh, into account the scales, the way in which kind of spatial scales have been completely uh, this scrambled by uh, connectivity and mobility on a plan and, and trade and all these logistical networks so that the planet has been interwoven with. So it is a chance to rethink the social uh, in spatial terms. It is uh, also uh, about uh, acknowledging how even the claims of socialism were based in uh, in a kind of science, in social sciences and data, and how the question uh, is reopened now that data has become a kind of something that is actualized and not just communicated to the public, but something that actually does uh, uh, work in uh, in governmentality in a direct way, and uh, also you know at the level of uh, uh, what is a socialist economic politics uh, uh, was closing on this debate uh, started between the kind of uh, the industry which claims we should just get back to work, and uh, and just get back to work in uh, uh, according to age. So starting with a thirty year old, uh, thirty to fifty, then fifty to sixty, then sixty. Uh, later and just take the loss into account and a document produced by 27 economists uh, from various Italian universities who actually claim that this is a, a good time uh, to really completely rethink monetary policy and the relationship uh, uh, to kind of social policies uh, after austerity. So there was a question for you actually from like anonymous people who are watching on YouTube. They ask you particularly Tiziana, what do you think is gonna happen to the idea of insurance and insurability as a result of this? As sort of part of like a, you know, insurance as a kind of social responsibility towards individual collective, you know, people pooling in resources to take care of a person when they're down or their car gets broken or house gets like broken into or something. I think this is something that obviously is different from uh, well, you know, depending on where you're speaking from. We have a socialist uh, healthcare system where everybody is insured, and uh, the, I think that uh, people have been talking a lot about the, the importance of this system, and also they say how uh, it damaged everybody. The fact that it, the, the cuts uh, because of the austerity that this uh, kind of state uh, system, public system have, and has undergone have been really damaging uh, and they damaged everybody. Uh, and so I, I think this is going to be a lot more support, more support, even more than before for the kind of national insurance, uh, public insurance, at least uh, in Italy. 
uh, this is for sure. I mean, there's uh, all this uh, uh, idealization or celebration of the public health system uh, right now, and it's opposed to the American health system as something that people do not want. And the popularity of kind of, again, Cuban doctors, you know, landing in Italy. And uh, uh, of course, we know that Chinese uh, health system is far from being a socialist one has been uh, heavily neoliberalized, but this is the, the kind of the, the image, the propaganda image that they are transmitting. And uh, so, yeah, I think there is a much more, at least here from the ground, there's much more support for the notion of a public universal health system for reinforcing it. They even have uh, granted that they, they, they for, it, for some time, they kind of, uh, uh, they had limited the number of people who would graduate as doctors in medicine, and now they've opened it up again. Uh, saying that we need we need more doctors and we need to invest even more uh, in, uh, in the public health system. We so this is uh, what I see. Yes, yeah, sorry. You know, one of our one of our one of our student Eric Mayer wanted to come in and ask you something. So I guess we're going to switch to Eric to particularly ask you something, and then after that, I guess we're going to go to JP Caron from Brazil. Okay. Go yeah. ahead. Eric. Hi everybody. Uh, can you understand me? Yes, absolutely. Okay, yes. perfectly. Yeah. So um, about the question of okay, um, what can be um, what the relation of okay in the more abstract sense okay the relation between um, political responses and political developments that will come out and that this uh, pandemic will um, will open and um, most of the leftist responses I have seen on texts on social media and so on were pretty much a, a vulgar anarchist uh, approach like okay oh state bad state uh, restricts our freedom let's go out on the big places and but basically like what the fuck do you want everybody to die or um like okay so sorry, sorry for being a bit vulgar myself but um um yeah and i just uh, uh, me and a couple of friends we, we thought okay isn't this like this is a this is a societal shock. Like we hadn't it. Like it, it's a it's a global societal shock. Like we couldn't have imagined years and maybe decades ago. And um, the question is how how do we react to this? And actually, in the I think it was yesterday with this. Okay, let uh, basically let the old people die to please the line, and open the economy, <laughs> um, uh, uh, reopen the economy. That it shows like okay. Um, a capitalist system it, it cannot have uh, it cannot um, uh, cannot react to the uh, to this kind of crisis uh, appropriately and I mean what do we think is going to happen with climate change this is just okay I mean we can even uh, uh, um, a bit like if we use this if we uh, let this have an impact on our mind, on our politics globally, then we can be kind of glad that this happened because it prepared us to a shift globally before the real big stuff with the, the real big consequences with climate change hit us and that we have somehow even a chance, a, a chance to uh, survive this with some, some kind of dignity and um, that um, like, what is completely missing from the left, I think, is this, okay, let's, let's, let's show and let's ask, okay, uh, let, let's show um, where are instances where capitalism cannot deal with this, that people are, uh, have a basic supply of, of groceries. And um, then, then the stuff with the, rent, pe uh, with the rent, people lose their jobs, cannot pay rent anymore. All this kind of stuff points towards, okay, this isn't, this isn't solvable. And this is just a, uh, a puzzle, a fragment that's falling, uh, falling apart more and more. And um, what I'm completely missing from the left is really this uh, to use this as a uh, as a chance and um, and to say, oh no, one, one, one can't. I mean, somebody, is, uh, uh, the right is come is is gonna uh, take this uh, take this chance. So if we don't. Uh, there is no white west to not politicize any kind of such uh, uh, such a situation, and yeah, I'm um, I'm, I'm really really uh, I should frustrated that uh, we don't 
take this chance and get into this kind of discourse. And the, as I said, most stuff I have said, seen were either obscure, this critical series stuff with just showed, okay, how useless is this? Uh, or this vulgar anarchist version with state necessarily bad. And yeah, um, I'd like to hear, I, I mean, of course, <laughs> we, we cannot just say, yeah, state bad, uh, either state bad or state good, and then China good, of course, that's not I just, I just, I just, I just want to tell you that the only, the only, the only decent response, like I said, was how people in the DSA world in US are trying to use this to sort of like translate some of their ideals and virtues into sort of like policies or pushing administration in US towards something. But as you said, I don't see any other sort of like coherent, organized leftist response to do wants to basically based on what you're saying and what Tiziana is saying, understand to, to basically act. And actually this is a moment I'm gonna like put my minute of critique, which is like, like already prior to the first Super Tuesday was the right moment for, for Sanders' campaign to actually begin bringing Corona into the discourse. They failed that. Whoever was around Sanders, whoever it is, they failed to understand. I mean, if I, in my limited mind as an artist, curator living in Berlin, could see in mid-February that this is gonna be big and it's gonna impact the primaries, if not a general election, in a very confrontational way. Why would nobody in their mind thought about that? That like with the discourse of Medicare for all and the need for social, more social security and more socialist measures to deal with this, why on earth the Sanders' campaign did not change their tune and they just kept going as if it was January, 2019 when the campaign was announced the same slogans same stuff and i think that was like a, a, a utter not failure but an utter like kind of like slowness and finally after weeks they're coming in and like they're trying to retool the campaign and you know when you see a series of articles coming out in jacobin i'm not saying that to start something because i think we, we should move on to jp without losing time but i but i thought i thought at least they're doing something now. Anyways, JP, would you like to like basically, basically uh, take over the mic? Yeah, thank you. Let's do it. You're welcome. JP's, JP's logging in from from uh, from Brazil. From uh, I'm Rio. really horrible with, with with city city names, but Rio, yeah. Rio, Rio. Basically, taught a seminar for us last semester, and will be teaching seminar for us. And his focus is a lot around. Uh, good men and world making. So let's see what his take is on. What's yeah, well, Mo, Mo asked me to say something about this crisis from the point of view of world making, which is kind of difficult, right? Uh, because my because take, this is not world making in terms of intentional world making, but the world is making itself. So it's, yeah, a, it's an it's, auto yeah, world making. Yeah, I was going to say that because I wrote a bunch of lines that I sent Mo, so maybe Mo picked up on that. The idea is that for me, from the point of view of world making, of course, we, we, are, we are not at a different world already. We are, we are at a transition between worlds, so to speak. Uh, there, are, there were so, so certain parameters to, you know, our ways of engaging with the world before, which are fundamentally changing and we don't really know where we are going to. So actually the issue for me, the, the, the biggest issue, and, and, and actually attaching this to the Brazilian situation, because as I told Mo before, uh, one, of, one of the things that, that puzzled me was because, uh, I took a stroll in the in Rio streets like four days ago or five days ago or something. And it, business as usual, everybody was on the streets, restaurants are full and uh, supermarkets are full. Everything is full, everything is open, right? And uh, I was well, isn't anybody uh, afraid of this situation? What's 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 really going on? So that, that's been said here in this in this uh, in this already in this uh, this discussion, the possible politicization of the virus, right? And this is going on already in Brazil. I mean, there is a, a clash between the federal government and the state government. State governors, certain of certain states, are are willing to take the measures to control the pandemic. 
Whereas the president is parading around saying that this is nothing but a little plume or something like that. And there is a political, uh, uh, political uh, issue behind it, which is, you know, the shrinking of the economy, which is the fear of the president because he has a stake on it, right? And the actual uh, death toll, which is also the, the stakes of the state governors, which are seizing an opportunity to, to, uh, uh, to lash into stardom, so to speak, to, to, get into, uh, to get into a relevant position nationally, you know, for future political uh, struggles. This has some effects, in a sense, because you know the disseminate the top-down dissemination of the gravity of the situation, which is supposed to inform, you know, our, our everyday phenomenology, so to speak, to see things as if they are happening, to see this virus as if it is real, even though we can't see the virus, we can only judge it by its effects, right? And its effects come after a delay. So this is the problem. So then I took a stroll two days ago and things were a little bit uh, more closed, less people on the streets. And I took a stroll yesterday and there, were, there was nobody in the streets, right? And the president is being, is being you know, picketed and everybody is protesting in, in their homes, actually. They're not going to the street to protest, right? So there is a, there is a possibility of an impeachment going on here. Uh, because of the, of, the, of the sanitary crisis, you know. So there are different tendencies of politicization already in place of this, of this pandemic. There is the, the top-down dissemination of, you know, uh, the criteria by which we must act as citizens, as individuals, right? Which is kind of, uh, somebody said that the, 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 the cybernetic feedback loop, you know, this cybernetic feedback loop here is kind of bifurcated. This is a problem. There's a, there's a jam, uh, the lines are jammed in a sense. Uh, from, you know, from the top-down perspective of media to the people or, or from government to the people, right? So this is, this is something important that has important consequences to our, you know, world uh, in the sense of the world that we see what is visible, right? So the virus is something that is not visible in a sense, but it is visible through its effects. And in order to be visible through its effects, we must believe the data. <laughs> and to believe the data, we must kind of uh, uh, calibrate our scenes as, we must see things as if this is true, right? So uh, mainly the issue here in Brazil, I think, control of the pandemic is in the hands of, you know, a correct understanding of, you know, and, and, a, and a, a kind of an integration of these different, different lines that are being jammed right, in the sense of the spread of the correct information, right? So uh, this was, was, was the main gist of what I, what I had to say about this, this, uh, this thing. And uh, the, also the fact that if, uh, if that it is reasonable to think that the correct way of acting is to uh, sustain social distancing, stay at home, the virus with this uh, invisibility becoming visible is making other things visible. It's making visible the difference between those who can sustain social distancing and those who cannot. So we see lots of people who can't uh, stop working. So. This is a this is a big issue. So all the all the all the you know, cries for social distancing, for generalized social distancing, there is a grain of truth that, in a sense, there is a kind of a class uh, class character of this discourse, because there are there are people that can't really do that. that. So, yeah, we are at the crossroads. We are really at the at a at a at a transition between one thing and the next. And uh, the responses that are to be taken are also at crossroads. There are those who, those who think that uh, our current atomized, individualized way of, 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 organ of politically organizing are becoming obsolete, right? But nevertheless, as Robin McKay uh, mentioned uh, at yesterday's play pod, there is also a, um, 
this virus is kind of a um, patchwork engine, so to speak. It is it is dividing states and nations. It is it is it is calling for the closing of borders without closing the line of communication. So there are kind of, there are uh, opposing tendencies at work. So this is what I Mo mentioned our conversation at, at the beginning of this stream about the Overton window. So it is definitely changing, because, but the, the tendencies are there and they are contradictory one to the other, right? So uh, yeah, just to keep short, uh, uh, um, yeah, this is mainly what I had uh, prepared. I actually wrote something, but- I, 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 I think Reza would wanna like ask you some stuff as he was telling me. Okay. Unmute yourself, Reza. Uh, uh, hi, JP, how are you? Hey. <sighs> okay, uh, just a couple of things. Uh, some actually are related uh, to your presentation and some not, but I would like to ask your opinion about these. Um, I actually noticed that, you know, pieces by Badiou uh, wasn't brought up actually today so far. Uh, and uh, you see, uh, uh, I was, uh, you know, we, uh, Valentina and I were talking uh, on a back channel, <laughs> a gossip channel. And we were uh, talking about this, uh, that uh, as Katrina was uh, talking about, you know, so uh, how can we make a political discourse around self-isolation and this kind of sheer survivalism, right? Uh, because, well, the thing is that there are uh, uh, two scenarios here. Uh, one is that, uh, you know, uh, if, we just succumb to that kind of pure survivalism, it is already a political discourse. It's called libertarianism of the most extreme degree, right? And libertarians are actually good at surviving this. Yes. But then what would be exactly uh, a, a kind of, uh, you know, political discourse or collective action that we can make around this scenario, as long as you said, we are socially distanced, but the channels of communications are not closed yet. So that's the first question for you. <clears throat> can you repeat the last the question, the last, the last few? Yes, sure. I was saying that, you see, so uh, as Robin was saying, uh, or you were saying that, okay, let's imagine that we have social distancing at this point, and uh, basically uh, we are at the brink of devolving into pure survivalism. Yep. That is in inevitable. Uh, you can't uh, uh, fault it. I mean, what do you expect people do? if you don't have a political alternative at this point. Well, everyone inevitably succumb to a Hobbesian jungle. Oh, yeah, yeah, so, so you're, you're asking- So I'm of, asking, yes, so as long as we have social distancing, but still uh, the uh, communication channels are open, what can we do? What kind of political discord? What yeah. kind of political, what, what, what would be in fact the prospects of such a thing without yeah. getting too overexcited about it? Yeah, without being sure it's like Yeah, well, uh, I could comment, for instance, in the difference on the difference between two different kinds of measures that are being talked about in Brazil, for instance. Uh, there is, a, let's say, uh, an official, the Bolsonaro one, that he tried to pass a provisional measure on uh, on, on Sunday that uh, uh, made possible for employers to keep their employees without pay for four months. Right. This is just to to just to to uh, keep uh, companies from breaking and to having to let people go and all of that. So this was a kind of a right wing response, right? Mm -hmm. And there is a there is a but, but there is an alternative, an alternative that's that's getting sorry. Uh, yeah, there is an alternative. The alternative would be to to sustain some kind of UBI, you know, and just basic income for everybody. So. Or, or even uh, a third one would be to push the idea that uh, the state might have to subsidize uh, uh, wages uh, up to a percentage. So 
if either companies don't, don't, don't broke or, or, or people who are, have something to eat, have some money to, to, to keep them by because uh, the, the, the provisional measure that was, that we tried to pass was pretty much draconian. People will just die as starvation, you know. So there is already, in a sense, it's not that it's not that it is impossible that that's, that that is the constitution of a political discourse around this is impossible. I think everybody is trying to seize the opportunity to build one, in a sense. But of course, everybody, I mean, mainly public public sector and you know policymakers, not not us as individuals, because of course social distancing puts pressure and puts a kind of makes it difficult to organize in a collective sense in physical spaces, right? So this is this is an issue. You are muted, Bertrand. Uh, 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 JP, do you think, is this the case that uh, the ongoing catastrophe, and it is actually a catastrophe, and I don't actually believe that um, the, I will talk about this later, uh, uh, Badiou's idea that this is uh, not an unprecedented uh, pandemic. No, it is unprecedented by any, by all means. It is like... Uh, he thinks it's uh, SARS-2 or something. Yes, I mean SARS-2. <laughs> I will talk about that later. But um, um, do you think uh, that's within this ongoing catastrophe, we can actually uh, pull off a certain kind of uh, political utopianistic imagination. I wouldn't say, with, uh, with, sorry, go on. With, with the caveat, with this caveat, that unfortunately, any sort of political imagination for a utopia that we can have a gleam of, from this catastrophe would be a double-edged sword. It acts both against the current global infrastructure as we know it, and also against the political traditional means of mobilizations that have that basically left has been resorted to for so many years. Definitely. Yeah, I wouldn't say utopian, right? I wouldn't say utopian, I would say we have to serve the conditions in a sense and uh, seize the, the opportunities within within the, the current within the current juncture to seize the opportunity to push more leftist responses whenever it is possible but it, it, it is far from from being a utopian scenario or, or, or yes by utopian i mean a certain kind of glimmer of hope of political hope yeah, yeah, well, there are glimmers of hope in a sense, uh, because, for instance, people, uh, what was the, I think it was the Jackson turn of phrase or, or Jameson's turn of phrase, it's easier to, to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. Actually, I think the end of, not maybe not the end of capitalism, but something uh, approaching it asymptotically is, be, is becoming to, to be thinkable. The, the issue is, uh, what comes next? So this is why this is why we must really push our political imagination towards. Yes, yes, because devise, 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 devise some kind of effect. Absolutely, I think I think uh, absence of that, essentially, uh, and I'm sure uh, uh, Dover will, will talk about this. Absence of that, after this is over, uh, there will be a fundamentally new technological infrastructure on the side of capitalism, because they have been, you know, seeing the catastrophe, they will uh, basically try to come up with better structures for themselves. And they are far more, uh, you know, in the advantageous position to do that. And which basically even slows down ever more any sort of leftist political action. Uh, Reza, I have, I have something I want to like bring it up because there's a few minutes before we go to uh, Joao, who's been like waiting for us, and also Francis wants to like wants to like throw in something. But my question is, with all this like talk of AI and algorithms and predictive patterns and neural networks, right? 
-hmm. what was it a Hollywood director in 2001 who could predict in the space of imagination of an artist and budget and like bad, good and bad acting like Gwyneth Paltrow and all that to imagine something so precisely similar to our moment that everyone just going back and watching Contagion, but these amazing algorithms could not model or predict to even help the bad capitalist guys that like something like this is coming. So you should even for your own sake, for your own profit, uh, prepare and change some of the procedures, add more infrastructure and deal with this. Why, why wasn't these systems able to do what an artist could do in 2011 with a movie so like, we just saw it, like you saw it, I saw it, some of the people around here, when you see Contagion, I saw it like in February. The minute the news came out, I was like, I gotta go to this movie because this is what it sounds like they're talking about in Wuhan, right? So yeah, so the question is really like the failure of like, failure of this like hyped up idea of AI and, and so like predictive modeling, right? To me, as someone who's looking at it from the edges, not from the outside, but, but I guess this is a question for Brunella. It could be a question for David Rodden. This could be a question for anyone here who deals with these topics, right? Like Tiziana, you know, like Anton, uh, whoever's, whoever's still around because I only get to see, yeah. So like if anybody wants to jump in and say, why was this not, not predicted by our intelligent machines? It was. It was, I think, too. It was. Good. Many, many Somebody th enlighten me. It didn't reach the level of popular culture for me to notice it, but I guess there was. So maybe you want to, like, enlighten us, sir. But such predictions uh, always, uh, when they are basically laid out to policymakers, they are not uh, going to be used as an actual blueprint of action, right? they will be basically use it uh, in order to uh, basically create various trade-offs with other sorts of agendas. And that's what shadowed this, the effectivity of AI here. But uh, David might actually have a better scenario on hand. I mean, having seen how lockdown occurred in New York day by day, what happened was individual executive boards uh, or, or possibly CEOs made the decision to start having people stay home from work. That was the only factor I could identify that actually triggered uh, a cascade or snowball to actually be getting lockdown. Governments were not going to take any action that was going to be economically harmful or even economically inconveniencing until pr the private sector made that move. So what about in China? That, it was government there, and everybody was saying that like, we should follow Chinese model. Who was saying it? Some no, I mean, no one took action. That's the thing, is that the only people that everybody might have been thinking this, but the only, the only, the only people who, who seem to feel that they, who seem to either have autonomy or take the autonomy to, initi to initiate a lockdown were actually private sector businesses and the CEOs of those private sector businesses. I cannot see a case in which uh, uh, there, there's some, there's, I guess there's some marginal cases, but for the most part, it was always started by, uh, by, by private sector uh, employees. There's a couple reversals like uh, in California, I think Disneyland was resistant to shutting down and I'd be very curious as to exactly what, what happened there. There's probably a more interesting social network here, but certainly in New York, it was, it was different, driven by the, by the private sector. I'm sure, I'm sure we're gonna go back to all of this. So, so Francis, why don't, you, why don't you join us? Unmute yourself and- Hi there. From Vienna, if you're unfamiliar, Francis is an incredible artist, painter, and I had the luxury of curating an exhibition of his work earlier, early in early April, 2019, good old days before this, where you could travel <laughs> and install exhibitions. And actually Adnan was there at the opening too. Adnan's with us too. We had such a great time last April in Vienna. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I'm not sure where to start. I'm, I'm just gonna try to pick up where you guys left off a little bit. Um, I, you know, I'm very suspicious of this, uh, this um, 
idea that we can somehow uh, like it's it's great. This is an opportunity. This is like kind of fact to try to put some new things into place to put a new discourse. But the thing that's showing up, all of the problems that are becoming very obvious are not new problems. I think it's very like back to the very beginning um, uh, when we were talking about um, uh, like the, or I think Ben mentioned it a little bit, the idea of centering, like, you know, historically not finding any kind of centering of the Spanish flu. I think this, this activity of centering like the war, a war or this or that is a very um, more, I mean, this is my intuition. Uh, I'm not a scholar of this kind of thing, but I think it's a very like um, modern creation. And it's not, you know, we still live in the same world that we lived in last year and 10 years ago and 20 years ago. Of course, these things change. And of course, there are times to like uh, try to push or to try to take advantage of the situation. But I think to even think of it as in terms of taking advantage of the situation is very much following in line with the kind of negative tendencies of the last 10 years. Basically, the the urge to reproduce is bigger than anything we're talking about here, in, in my opinion. And I see it already in the like art um, journals that are still online. They're like trying to reproduce the same kind of content, which is already kind of thin. And you see like, okay, everybody is in at home. So what do we do? We make a list of 10 recipes that artists have made in their home because we're all home cooking every day. I mean, what is this? Like, um, this, this is just like um, absurd to me. Um, I had another thought there, but I just like went out because I got absurded all of a sudden. Well, you know what is more what is more pathetic than the art news and and artsy's response is actually if you watch all these like really depressed and worried late night talk show hosts trying to redo this from home without post production without graphics without makeup without crew without special effects i watched seth myers last night and i just thought this actually is bad for people because even though he was saying like really important things but then i thought it's just not funny. And like, he's not even like, it's just, why are you guys doing this from home? Why don't you just stop your program? You know, like, you know, Wendy Williams was good because she's like black and she knows how to handle this. And it's also like, she's, she's like okay at the domestic space, but like all the other people who are trying to redo this, it's just like, it's a, it's a complete failure of American like popular media. So I guess RT and stuff are doing just a little bit better. Well, I, I, also, what I'm seeing a lot is like, like this really, all of the really kind of crappy uh, definitions of culture um, that are out there are becoming exaggerated at the moment. Like, okay, what is art good for? Art is good because we can go on the corner on our balcony and like play the guitar and make everybody happy. So like, it's all these negative images and art is supposed to make people happy. And this is like, you know, um, no, <laughs> like, so, from my point of view, I mean, I mean, honestly, my daily life is pretty much exactly the same as it has been for quite some time. It's just my prospects have maybe changed a little bit. I see people freaking out like because they need to get, you know, we need to find a way to make money. Of course, I, I, I do too, like we all do. Um, but I think that um, yeah, like this you know, this goes back to one of this first questions that you put out there or that somebody put out there um, about the possibility of art to do anything. And I, um, I strongly believe that there's a possibility to do it. How I define that, I, I mean, I don't know. That's not what I'm doing. That's not what I do in my life. I don't define what defines how I'm trying to actually um, find my way into having some kind of impact. But art has the possibility to affect something in the way that any individual person has a way to affect something. And art is not something that is attached to an individual. It's not about this individualism and this um, uh, exceptionalism, which I think is very much tied to this idea of centering things. 
Why is our history written about World War II? Why is it not written around the history of migration? Uh, why are we not talking about what is the EU going to survive? And what happens with our borders? Are, are, is this, our borders, are they going to become a better skin or functional organ? Or are they really going to be a dysfunctional organ? I can't hear you because you're oh, muted. Don't worry, I mute myself so you, 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 there's no like added noise here. Okay, I thought you were saying something to me. Um, I mean, just a little something. Go ahead. Hello. Hello? Okay. Yeah. Uh, no, this this uh, this this idea that art can can or cannot do something. I mean, if it is the thing is, if it is if it's directly politicized as a class, you know, artists are not wage laborers. They 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 are actually more akin to you know. Uh, impresarios of themselves, so they they kind of own their means of production and all that. So this is there is always a, a division when artists want to you know embrace uh, you know working class demands with their art. But nevertheless, this this is not really. I don't think this is really the, the way to go. But maybe art has something, some role in it, like. Uh, Taking from what I said about you know the phenomenology of all of that, art can maybe and you were mentioning this this movie Contagion, art can maybe help make visible something, you know because all of this in a sense is going going on at, at different scales. The virus is at a different scale. Its effects are at a different scale. As long as we don't get it, as long as our loved ones don't don't get it, it's not it's not really there in our field of experience, right? So maybe we can mobilize artistic means to make things visible in a sense. And this was, I'm indebted to my friend Gabriel Tubinuma for this. This was the idea of, you know, the, 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 the old uh, Jameson idea of the cognitive mapping, right? The problem is that uh, at the moment art takes upon itself the task to do it, it, it falls back into, into the first case. No, now we are like, we are closing ranks with our brothers, labor, uh, wage, wage laborers or something like that. And, and they, then you get a different contradiction going on. So it's just, just, just wanted to, to add this. To the awesome. Mm -hmm. I, would, I would add that most artists I know are also wage laborers. So. Joao, you've been, you've been in Berlin. You came to Berlin to make a film about the impact of HIV epidemic on gay sexual practices, right? And uh, your film got yeah. caught in the middle of this. You had to change your plan. You did your best. We've been kind of following it on social media. If you want to like start there, it's good. But, or if you want to like basically address what you, what you told me you would like to address, go ahead. But I just thought it was interesting that you were here to like work around us cultural and social effects of the last major epidemic. And this happened and it kind of grounded you in a way, at least partially. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess, well, the, the film was about, is about the, uh, the impact of antiretrovirals on, on gay male sexual subcultures. Um, and it did change a lot as a, re as a result of the um, coronavirus and, and the various kinds of, of regulations that were, were put in place progressively in Berlin. Um, and yeah, so I think one of the, one of the interesting things, and again, looking, I've been thinking a lot about that project that I've been doing and, you know, uh, a book that I, that I just wrote, which is at the moment I'm thinking, you know, does it even make sense anymore in the context of, of, of apparently these, uh, the biggest pandemic that according to many people um, when I, I seem to have been focused on a different pandemic uh, and its aftermath. Um, and I mean one, one of the one of the things that that I I've been thinking about, uh, which is about uh, kind of a different parallel history and culture of, of epidemics that has to do with the the age epidemic and with, with HIV and, and how how that uh, for many of us was a much bigger 
uh, thing that uh, led to so many of us seeing uh, people die and not necessarily my uh, so much my generation, but those, I guess, who, who were there before me. Um, and, and how none of that uh, knowledge and history seems to suddenly bear any, any to come into being factored into everyone screaming about the virus that literally has a much lower uh, mortality rate. Um, and so I've been feeling really angry and bitter uh, whilst acknowledging the, the necessity of putting measures into place to, to contain this, this thing. Um, but but um, no one has even, uh, in particular around issues of self-isolation and around you know, isolated people who live in your household, isolate with, with your family or isolate with, with whoever. Uh, and for, for many of us, that kind of rings no bells or has very different um, resonances. Um, uh, Joao, you realize we're at the stage in, the epi in, in this pandemic compared to epidemic where people were asked to put double condoms before giving a blowjob. So we're at that stage right now. You got to understand. Uh, I, I have not been asked for, for that, but I, I trust you, Mo. Um, what, um, I mean, what, what I, I think it, it's, um, so what, so I've been caught in Berlin uh, with calls to go back, like fly back home. And that was one of the things I was, uh, I, I was talking to Ben about was, you know, like, wh where should I be coming, like flying back for to, you know, am I supposed to be going back to the UK uh, where I live or am I supposed to be going back to, to like to Portugal or, or am I supposed to be going to actually stay here because it's, you know, where, where my partner actually is. If I stay here, can we walk together in the street because I actually don't live here? Um, will they ask me for proof of address or, or, or all those kinds of things? Um, so all these these issues around self isolation and and the kinds of, of contact that you are allowed to do and not do uh, actually queer people uh, have a lot to 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 say about um, particularly how. Uh, we still manage to develop strategies of, 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 of uh, intimacy uh, during an epidemic that was actually killing all of us, um, <laughs> much uh, more deadly and much more severe and, 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 and than, than what's currently going on. Um, and, and, and so this issue between you know, community, and I, I'm kind of maybe, I guess, drawing I'm not a philosopher, but I'm thinking about, you know, Esposito's work on, on, on community and, and this idea that, uh, you know, the tension between community and immunity and community being, being uh, that which kind of has a tendency to kill you and, and immunity being the kind of the systems that are put in place to, to, to control the community's, I guess, drive towards death. Oh, what's this? And so, yeah, so um, I just had a problem with the microphone. So one of the things that I, I, I was thinking uh, is, is a lot about what's been asked from people, in which ways can actually we, we try to, to live a, a reasonable uh, life that takes into account what's going on without uh, falling into unnecessary panics and without becoming um, actually completely isolated from one another. And these are, these are all things that, that during, during the AIDS crisis, uh, many queer people, many uh, gay men found, found strategies to, to, to do and, and ways to do and negotiate. Uh, I'm kind of uh, diatribing at the moment or, or kind of going on various tangents, but, but yes, those are kind of those are mostly the, the questions that I've been I've been thinking about, and about how little do people seem to have in their memory that you know only like thirty years ago there was there were thousands of people literally falling down and no one gave a shit or oh, no or oh, no one even uh, it took them years to to get medical research uh, in the on the case. So I think we're quite actually quite a lot better than we were in the 80s and, and the 90s in that respect. 
Okay, so I kind of like, I, I was hoping that we we get to Inigo before Joao, but then I mixed up. But Inigo, we got a health, we got a, we got, we got a health professionals in the house and epidemiologist from New York who would like to just join us now because she has to go back to work. So why don't we get, why don't we get Sophie for a few minutes and then you can just join Sophie basically because I'm sure Sophie's gonna say a lot of interesting things. Sophie, if you're on, please turn your mic on and basically present. There we go. Hello. Okay, we can hear you. There you go. Can you hear me? Yes. You might want to turn your video because your signal is not good. Okay, go ahead. Can you hear me now? Yes, much okay, better. Go ahead. Hi. Yes, much better. All right. Um, my name is Sophie Lazar. I'm an epidemiologist and uh, public health um, professional in Boston, Massachusetts, and I'm working on on the uh, COVID, managing COVID outbreak in the homeless population in Boston, which is the United States. Sophie, it's impossible to understand you. Why don't we move to Inigo and you try to find a better spot with a better, better Wi-Fi because it's, it's just, we can't hear you, basically. Inigo, go ahead. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. Can you hear me? Mm, oh, yeah. We, it's cutting in and out, Sophie. Okay. So, um, so, can you guys hear me now? It's funny because now Inigo froze. What? I think Inigo froze. We can hear Maybe give it another try. Okay. Let me see. Why don't I shut down some of my files? Um, my computer is totally frozen. Should I? Uh, should, I... Should, should I wait? Is Sophie going to go now? Or? Is Sophie going to go now? Or? Yes, I'm trying. Inigo, the floor is yours. Okay. I'm here. Okay. Um, is it working now? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. This is just like part of the problem, right? Like we're dealing with like emergency. <laughs> go ahead, Sophie. But really, the three times you tried, we couldn't hear anything. But go ahead. No. Can you hear me now? Yes. Great. My name is Sophie Lazar. I'm an epidemiologist by training and a public health professional working on the COVID-19 um, outbreak in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, and the homeless population there, and Boston is the 10th largest city, and I think we have the 11th largest outbreak in the United States right now. Can you guys hear me? Yes. yes. Great. Um, is there anything that in particular, because I can just speak to kind of the work that we're doing, but if there's anything in particular that you'd like to discuss. No, no, it's great if you just go with that and then questions will arise. Go ahead. Sure. Yeah. So uh, one of our big concerns is about our quarantine and isolation efforts here for people who are experiencing homelessness. Um, at least in the United States, we have a pretty large homeless population scattered across the country. Um, particularly in cities like Los Angeles, San Francisco, New York City, and to some extent in Boston as well. And the quarantine efforts have been very much complicated by our um, inability to find spaces, safe spaces for people who are living on the street um, to quarantine themselves in risk of exposure. So we have built a series of tents throughout the city um, where we're holding patients in quarantine as well as, um, you know, we have nurses and doctors on site and we're doing, you know, kind of case tracking, which is uh, when um, we know someone's been exposed, we're trying to find out who's also been exposed in that um, social network, so to speak. And, 
interviewing those people and trying to uh, quarantine and isolate all of those people uh, were complicated by the fact that we're also experiencing quite a large opiate epidemic as well, which is kind of in the background right now. And that limits our ability to uh, provide treatment to patients who are actively using substances uh, because they don't have much incentive to want to stick around for treatment. As of today, uh, we had confirmation that there are two um, positive cases in the community. One patient is currently in the hospital right now, and the other patient is someone who was recently housed in our like public housing. So that person is able to um, recuperate from home. And we also have a positive um, a provider, a medical provider, who tested positive, who seems to be recuperating successfully. So we've been lucky in that um, our population is skewing a little bit younger. So they have a greater shot at not facing some of the complications of the disease. Yes, and our medical staff is definitely massively exposed. We have quite a severe um, protective equipment shortage. So like rationing that has been a really complicated discussion and not everyone who's working with these patients always has access to equipment that we would otherwise uh, prefer for them to have. Um, da, 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 death drive, cybernetic. Um, that's for you. Cybernetic. Actually, Valentin has some questions for you. Sure. Yeah. Uh, hi. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it's, we, I'm glad to that we have a person who is like troops on the ground in this yes. situation. And um, thank you for taking time for us. Uh, so one thing that recurrently was uh, discussed in chat and here is uh, different, like class structure of this exposure. So you you work with the most uh, uh, disempowered people, but do you think uh, uh, like the upper classes have it much better, or do you think it's kind of same level of danger and problem? Yeah, I work with I think what Marx would refer to as a lumpen proletariat. You know, they're not really they don't have class conscience in that sense. They're kind of you know the reserve army of the capitalists. Um, and I would say that disproportionately, this really does skew toward affecting lower income people only because the work that they do just leaves them more exposed to the open. There have been quite a number of calls from upper class um, people who are older saying, no, we should really get back to work. But what they're skewing in that message is that they are not people who work in any capacity where they're being exposed to the general public. And disproportionately, the people who are exposed to the general public are people in caring professions. So it's also like the feminization of labor so that women who are, you know, care attendants, nurses, uh, grocery store clerks, um, kindergarten teachers, you know, in nursing home, you know, people who work with the elderly, they are disproportionately going to be the most affected. And it's the people who can manage to do their work at home, which is primarily this kind of technocratic class of people who will be the most, uh, or be, they'll be the least at risk, really. Um, but I think it's very telling that when you have an infectious outbreak that is not predicated on social behaviors like HIV, and I think that's a big distinction here, is that really anyone is at risk and many of the diseases that compromise you are illnesses of um, social mobility. Like diabetes often affects people in the upper class because it's overconsumption of certain foods that are really only available in you know, higher income societies. Um, and, uh, you know, pulmonary disease that often comes from smoking. And I think we're seeing really cigarette usage is the, like, is the most predictive factor of complications from COVID. And I think there's like a 14, uh, 14 times the risk of mortality rate from tobacco intake that's done um, through inhalation. So... Now is the time to quit smoking, I should say, as an American who has we have very robust anti-smoking um, policies here. But that's really something that if you're looking in Italy and you're looking at Spain and you're wondering why people are dying so rapidly. And Indonesia is another great example. Indonesia has four times less cases than Australia, but four times greater mortality. And it's because older men in these countries disproportionately smoke cigarettes. And that's leading to higher fatality rates. Mm -hmm. um, 
I see. My, huh? Yeah, SIG usage, sad face, absolutely. So my, um, my second question would be, well, the work you're doing, is it, are you trying to control the spread or is it completely damage controlled by now? Like, are you, uh, is there any hope to kind of curb the spread? Yeah, there's absolutely hope to curb the spread. I think that in some countries like, you know, in Spain, in Italy, that's not really going to be the case. Now it's damage control there in the United States and for most of Western Europe and, you know, actually Eastern Europe has been doing pretty well with managing COVID, um, particularly Russia. Um, but I think that's mostly because Siberia is essentially still social distancing. Um, but um, we're still in the place where we are openly monitoring and tracking like cases, the first cases. And um, I think there's a lot of time has been lost because of Trump's policies that if had been implemented earlier, we could have been a much more effective. Germany is a very excellent model they have the lowest rate and that's because their testing and quarantine model is so effective basically we're seeing countries that test very quickly and are able to really coordinate around very early testing results are better able to control these outbreaks but definitely we only have two cases in the homeless community so we're still doing a lot of prevention here and yeah okay. I don't know if um, like what, what you said is um like it, it really doesn't um like in russia we don't really believe any statistics that coming from the government mm -hmm. uh, and in germany there is not actually a lot of testing being done and uh, most of tests uh, for a long time were like really negative um so and, and quarantine is not that severe here so yeah I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, it's interesting what you're saying because it's such I'm also seeing it from an American perspective. I don't know on the ground, but that's just the research that we're getting in from the CDC, from other countries. So again, like the, you're very correct that we don't know if the data from Russia is correct and it could be much higher and they could be repressing that information. I would also say to the person who said that 50% of the hospitalized in the Netherlands are under 50. That's actually a very good indicator if they're hospitalizing people under the age of 50 because those people have the lower mortality rates and it means that those those countries have the space to take to inpatient except um younger people um you'll note that there's a difference between hospitalization and mortality and many of the people who are dying don't even make it to the hospital which is the real tragedy as we've seen in spain um yeah and i'm, I'm just also thinking about uh there's a lot of stuff coming in and i'm trying to address it as it comes in. Um, but I'll speak more to the American experience because it seems like we have a lot of people who are coming in, chiming in internationally who have probably more information on the ground. But what I can say about the American experience here is that we're very, we're limited in terms of protective equipment. And so that's, that's hazarding our approach to managing the outbreak. And we're also limited in testing. Um, I think that has more to do with our privatized healthcare system. Um, but both of those measures inhibit our ability to respond like in the moment. So what we've basically been doing is we're relying on symptoms in terms of who we're isolating and who we're quarantining. And we're recommending that people who think they can manage this on their own stay at home because hospitals, a site of um, hospital-based infection is pretty um, serious. So we're also getting lower numbers in terms of that. So there's this real risk of um, under reporting and then kind of also countries and states that have more financial access, um, having more ability to test. So the numbers are looking skewed and we're seeing a lot of states that are in the South part of the United States, which is traditionally uh, less wealthy. They're reporting sometimes lower numbers, but that's because their ability to test is greatly limited. So I saw news, I think today or yesterday about Hong Kong loosening its, um, self-isolation measures and Im that immediately brought a new outbreak so yeah. it, it really feels like we're going to be in long lockdown for a very long time yeah. uh, and uh, what do you think do you think when vaccine uh, vaccine is being uh, implemented do you think it's going to be uh, we're going to be able to deploy it quickly all over the world or it's not going to be easy anyway yes um and i just well there's one thing i just want to comment about to this person ben miller um, 
I didn't mean to imply that HIV doesn't affect everyone. I meant to say that the social uh, perspective of HIV was that it was limited to certain subgroups. And that's why the mainstream media did not, um, you know, jump on this or take any effective action. Ronald Reagan in the United States didn't mention this until 1987. Um in any speech, because the idea was, oh, it's a it's a disease that's affecting only the parasites of American society. Um, I definitely agree with you about the erasure of HIV history, but what I'm saying is not that it's correct, but that the social um, perspective of it was that this only affects stigmatized groups, therefore the average American doesn't have to care, whereas this affects people over the age of 70, and that disproportionately in the United States, we're a guarantocracy, so to speak, so there's a lot more public attention being put in that way, that unfortunately was very limited in the early stages of the HIV outbreaks. Um, and then to answer your question, I do think that for the best of public health, um, keeping the quarantine measures in place is really the best thing that we can offer. I think France is, you know, doing a better, doing it as a good example of what's, you know, a good model to follow. And I know this is really unfortunate because now it feels like we're basically, you know, the the economic question of this comes into play. Um, but I'm just looking at the data here and I think for the best of everyone, staying put in for the long term is what it's going to look like. And we, yeah. Uh, but still, uh, is uh, about vaccine. Do you think there is a hope for quick resolution using the vaccination for everyone or something like this? I or... think that comes two different questions. One is that yes, there's definitely a vaccine on the horizon, but two is about the distribution of the vaccine and the equity of that distribution because it seems that American companies are trying to patent the vaccine um, in order to make money off of the vaccine. And so that's going to be a whole another can of worms that's going to open is about the availability of the vaccine and if it's going to be freely distributed. And that's something that, you know, I also have to say that for many of you coming in, you are um, philosophers, social scientists, um, hu human, like in the humanities, I'm speaking really from an epidemiologist point of view. So if I say things that don't sound, you know, as, in the don't sound in the language that you're more comfortable discussing these things in. if I'm talking in more technical terms like please um, call me out if anything sounds biased and I'll try to explain myself as best as I can I don't mean to um, impart like any kind of you know stigma or um, any kind of like personal biases here um, but yeah, I think that the vaccine's on the horizon and that will be great. But I think the other thing to remember is that coronaviruses are, they do have the ability to mutate. And so we'll see what will happen and because there will definitely, my guess is that there will be a resurgence next winter, next fall, next winter, kind of like what we have with the flu where we take the best guess as epidemiologists and our flu shot protects about 30% of the strains. And um, I think my, the last question I have is, as, as a scholar of epidemics, you know that uh, a lot of, uh, like sometimes it's pointed out, but some epidemics like Black Plague, for example, leads to some uh, long-term uh, positive right. effects, positive in some, in some sense, right? Like not necessarily good for society, but like something. What do you think is, is there any, is there any good Coming out. Is there any silver lining in this? Silver lining. Um, uh, hard to, for me to answer from an ethical perspective, and I can't speak on behalf. I mean, I can only speak for myself. Everything I'm speaking here is from you know my personal perspective, not any of the agencies that I work with or contract with. Um, it's very hard to say, um, and it's very difficult not to assign meaning to epidemics. Um, I think it's you know it's it's difficult for us to refrain from kind of creating some narrative that suits, you know, how we see the world. Um, you know, my hope is that it will lead people to really reconsider um, certain measures that they need to be working, you know, in the physical location of where they work. I'm hoping that it will encourage people to, you know, continue adopting hygiene methods like washing your hands um, correctly. Like that's something that people should just continue doing regardless of an epidemic or not. Um, that's kind of my uh, very safe answer. Um, 
I would say in the long run, you know, it's very interesting that we're having an epidemic that's affecting very much the older segment of society because as I think if you do any kind of cursory demographic examination of the European Union, of the United States, you know, these countries have trends that are, you know, the demographic shift is that these countries are quite old and it will be very interesting to see in if there is an outcome where uh, the age, um, you know, if demographically, if there's, you know, age trends toward younger populations or not. Um, whatever's happening it is very interesting, but I would want people to refrain from any kind of like eugenics uh, narrative. And that goes for talk about herd immunity. And I just want to be very specific here that herd immunity really refers to the process with vaccines of protecting people who are immunodeficient, not exposing a huge segment of the population and seeing who lives and letting those people live and the others to die. That is, that is eugenics. That is not herd immunity. Herd immunity is very specifically about um, helping people who are immunocompromised by vaccinating the mass population. You know, you probably don't see YouTube chat, but everyone is so glad you're here and we needed this so much. <laughs> you have I no really idea. Listen, I, I'm speaking for my, I can only speak for myself. I'm not speaking, um, these, this is not like my organization. I have to be really clear about that. Um, yeah. And also One the thing. news is coming in so quickly that if something I say is out of date by the end of this day, I wouldn't be surprised because we're all learning here together as this is, going on but i will say that trump lost a pretty a valuable amount of time in how he is running the country and his statement that we're going to open the united states up by um easter is uh suicidal at best and like completely psychotic thank you so much sophie sorry we have to like move on because like we're yeah. literally going to, like we're accumulating falling behind Inigo, yeah. why don't you start? And apologies, Inigo, for making you start three times and then stopping you again. So that's okay. That, that's okay. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Sophie. That was so useful to have uh, have somebody who knows about this about what's going on properly. Uh, stick around. And, uh, stick around. But yeah. you know you have work to do, so you might have to go. I might have to go. But thank you so much. Thank you, You're Valentine. Bye bye. Bye bye. And yeah, I have to, uh, I, I, first of all, I'd, I'd say, yeah, um, I, I have to agree with Sophie about the way that this is, uh, you know, really a, a having a class effect. So it's a class epidemic or pandemic, really. And this is something David Harvey said also. He talked about the way that, uh, the, 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 that uh, this is affecting, uh, you know, it's, there's a racialized effect to this as well as a class effect to this in the terms of the who, who is on the front line in uh, in interacting and getting getting the risk? And so, what I I mean, what I wanted to talk about, what I was working on when this happened, was actually uh, trying to revise my writing on uh, on the, the black swan, um, which is um, which, which is the idea that uh, Nassim Taleb popularized, and. Um, <clears throat> And clearly, you know, there's a there's a, a relationship between that, and there's been a, a, a bit of talk about it. Uh, and Nassim Taleb has uh, has been writing some papers recently on the on the coronavirus. Um, and in his, uh, I mean, in his uh, his Black Swan book, he said uh, there's a sentence there. He says, as we travel more on the planet. Uh, epidemics will become will be more acute. We'll have a germ population dominated by a few numbers, and the successful killer will spread vastly more effectively. So, he was, it, you know, his ideas there were already about this uh, kind of the nature by which probability changes uh, according to kind of networked uh, interconnectedness, uh, and uh, and so. Um, you know, and I think the papers that, you know, he's, he's written so the, the, a, a very useful kind of response to Ferguson's uh, modeling for the UK uh, and um, where he's, you know, arguing that they haven't properly uh, modeled the, the, the fat tails that are going on there from super spreaders. Um, but I think, uh, um, 
there's you know that and really okay uh, my my work here is kind of on uh, on on something like an intersection between philosophy and 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 uh and economics here and so uh i want to talk about try and talk about both of these issues how how they cross over um Firstly, I would uh, I would say that uh, okay, the idea of the black swan is is used uh, in in economics uh, generally in order to uh, to uphold economic theory uh, and to to legitimise capitalism by saying that this is uh, an exogenous shock to the system. So, you know, the, the, the market is fine, you know, the, 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 our models are fine. It's just that there's been this shock from the outside that has caused this problem. And uh, I think, you know, there's a, well, there's a, there was a great piece by, uh, by a Marxist economist uh, called Michael Roberts uh, recently, just arguing, you know, this is this is not a black swan. Uh, this is, uh, you know, so the the financial crisis that we're seeing happening right now as a result of, you know, obviously, you know, uh, it was triggered by this uh, by this uh, pandemic, but it was waiting. It was it was waiting to happen because uh, the the you know the capital capitalism goes through these recurrent crises. And the, the, we've been in, a, in effectively a long depression for, for, for some time. Uh, and this is, it's, it's, it's just been a trigger to what are already kind of endemic problems to capitalism. Uh, and, you know, it, it's going to have a huge effect. Uh, um, already we've seen, for example, you know, the Fed has just injected $4 trillion into the economy. Uh, at, uh, at least somebody is acting because Trump was was kind of uh, dithering about it, uh, um, and you know. But uh, the, the the as Michael Roberts argues, this is just uh, tiny compared with the amount of loss to the economy that is going to happen, uh, and uh, and so really we're going to see the effects of this uh, in the economy for a, uh, for a long time. Uh, and of course, that's going to mean massive unemployment for a lot of people, uh, you know, a huge loss of life, not just from the virus, but from, from economic impact. Uh, so, um, and of course, okay, so this, uh, this brings up philosophical problems, you know, so there's uh, another, um, a philosopher called Eliyash, who's who's done stuff at the New Center, and uh, he wrote a book called *The Blank Swan*, which is a kind of response to to Taleb's *The Black Swan*. Um, and there, you know, he's arguing, uh, you know, he's following kind of Maya Su's idea of the absolutization of contingency. So he's saying there's there's an absolute contingency of the market, um, and his argument is, I mean, it's very similar. It's quite similar to this, uh, these other economists called uh, Schaefer and Volk, who, are, who have this book uh, called It's Only a Game, where they kind of do this kind of game theoretic version of probability theory. So they're arguing for price over probability, that price is, has a primacy over probability theory. Uh, and um, it's, uh, you know, Ayash is arguing this this same kind of uh, or really radicalizing their, their their argument, right? So he's saying kind of price uh, price is first because it's the trader's action in the market that comes before probability formalisms, right? And uh, I, I mean, to me, I think this is uh, you know it's it's very problematic. I mean, I, I would say this is uh, effectively not just an absolutization of contingency, which is philosophically problematic, but also uh, a, 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 you know, if an absolutization of the commodity fetishism of the derivatives market. Uh, and, you know, in, in, the, in the face of this kind of pandemic that we're seeing right now, this, it's, it really seems quite a disgusting argument. 
uh, you know, effectively, uh, you know, they, 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 so, so the main kind of idea of this kind of, of putting price over probability is, is to, it, it comes from two kind of, uh, two kind of major kind of principles, right? So one is the impossibility of the gambling system. So uh, like a martingale that would allow you to beat the market. And two is the principle of dynamic hedging, right? So ensuring yourself as, as you as, as you move. And this is what the derivatives trader does, right? But the, the you know, the 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 issue is here, uh, you know, uh, Okay, so price is 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 pricing is uh, is power is capital power, uh, and and this is something that is not acknowledged in any way critically at all in Ayash's argument, uh, and uh, you know I think that and this, this, so this, so the the issue of insurance was brought up earlier, and I, you know I think really now this is the this is the time where we have to. Uh, call for it at, at a massive scale and you know really uh you know if if i i kind of agree you know i i i think it's it's true that uh that the the this argument that uh that uh there's something kind of primary about uh pricing with regard to probability formalisms right because pricing is an action okay and there's and and there's and this is uh the the it's similar to to the way in which uh, you know uh, um, acting is it, you know to, to the way in which uh, semantics is grounded in pragmatics, right? So uh, so pragmatics has a kind of primacy over semantics, and so you know the the any, for any probability formalism that you put forward, there's always going to be somebody who's going to outbid your probability formalism, right? But then, okay, uh, so that doesn't mean like you know the 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 general kind of strategy, you know, the the derivatives trading strategy for hedging is all based on this individualistic form of insurance, right? So, is there a possibility for a collective insurance? Uh, I think so. I mean, I think you know the NHS is already kind of something like a collective insurance, right? One which has been eradicated over the last thirty years, uh, and uh, you know uh, we're seeing that we're seeing that the, the return of certain world welfare state measures in response to the crisis. I think that should be you know radicalized, globalized, and uh, and. You know, it's not just uh, you know th this this uh, this pandemic that we're seeing now. This is global catastrophe. Is is one of many to come, right? Uh, the, the, this is you know we've got ecological crises that are coming right right on top of it, and political crises and technological crises and so on that are going to come fairly soon afterwards, right? What so so then. I, I think that there is a possibility of of of, uh, of something like a, a a kind of global collective insurance policy. You know, and maybe insurance is not the correct word here because insurance is usually you know what allows uh, an individual to bear risk. But what we need is something more like a, you know actual active. Uh, you know, reduction of risk by constructing new infrastructures and alternative ways of living that would, uh, that, that would, uh, you know, and- And healthcare, generally... and healthcare. Yeah. Healthcare, absolutely, first, first of all, right? But, but also, you know, I think, you know, ecological crises are coming and we, so we need to act on, on those by, by actively e intervening in, in, the, in the, the, the disasters that are coming. And, you know, the, like we, there was also talk about, you know, oh, was this, you know, uh, was this predicted or not? Uh, y yes, people, people have been talking about pandemics for a long time. We all, we, we knew that there was the, a high likelihood of a pandemic. But the but but it's about what what action do you take and the actions that were taken were, were, were nothing you know because it was you know capital was more important uh, but, and but, and but, but Inigo I want to like but Inigo Soderbergh actually made the film the film yeah. did well maybe in, at the box office right 
but now everybody is going to it, right? But we don't have anything similar happening with like, of course, predictions were made, but like they weren't made at the level that will, to use uh, Eli Ayesha's language that set a new price, it didn't. It was just like a ch chatter, right? It wasn't really something tangible. Like when you watch Contagion, you're actually like, you go like, holy shit. This is so close to exaggerated, dramatic version of what we're experiencing in a way, right? In that sense, or in the, at that scale or effect, there was nothing coming from sort of like statistical computation and modeling and all these like incredible abilities that we claim that we have. But since that movie was made in 2011, you know, not like last year, right? So it yeah. comes seven years prior, but it's more precise than our computational models. That's, that's yeah. all make comparison to, right? Of course, some people said pandemics are coming, you know? But how many people put $9 million or $14 million <laughs> into producing something that would like impact the popular mind about it, right? This is- Because sort of apocalypticism thing. always sell. No, but no, but the thing is, the, the success of turning something invisible into something phenomenologically visible, you know, we're talking about here. Yes, yes. Go but, ahead, but the Rasen. thing go is ahead. that, my apologies, my apologies. No, 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 go ahead. You haven't spoken. Uh, I, was, I was just saying that apocalypticism always sell. And that's basically the, the, uh, the, 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 the obscure char of apocalypticism. Sometimes right. it might not happen, but sometimes with these kinds of factors, it will definitely happen. I remember I read an interview with Richard Cadbury uh, in the late 90s, the author of Metrophage. Uh, it's a virus that basically this, this, this completely eradicates cities. And uh, he said that, you know, uh, I think the virus trope is very 90s, but like any sort of sci-fi trope, give it a couple of decades and it becomes a reality. So my question to Enigo uh, would be, uh, I don't think that we should actually talk about the severity or the fat fatality of this pandemic because Pandemics, good pandemics, I mean, really global pandemics, you know, those are which are really dangerous, are not about the rate of mortality. It's about how fast, how quickly, and how expansive they can spread, such that they can put so much a strain on every sector of society and economy where you can no longer say that economic meltdown is worse than virus. No, virus is actually more dangerous because it can target certain kind of hidden elements of, of society that even economy hasn't picked up. And economy nevertheless is built upon them. So what do you think about uh, this idea that um, a, a, a more pessimistic uh, scenario that the situation will get so bad at some point that climate change will be put on hold. All sorts of catastrophic long-term pandemics, ecological, so on and so forth, will be put on hold because of the sheer strain on every sector of civilization as we know it. Yes, it's quite possible. Uh, I mean, you know, uh, we're, we're we're all acting in the dark to some extent here, right? Because we're because the the we, you know it's it's not uh, it it's not clear how this is going to play out, you know, and it's uh, <laughs> it's it's certainly uh, it's certainly possible that this is going to 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 kind of you know, be also not just, you know, uh, have this severe short impact, but also have a, have a longer lasting impact, right? Uh, and, uh, and, and that may kind of completely destroy any semblance of kind of economic kind of organization. Uh, uh, but, you know, uh, I think, uh, you know, there's, there's, uh, there's, uh, there's a necessity, nevertheless, to plan out of this, right? To to yes. to, to organize, right? You know, yes. the, the, you, we can't just give up and and go into this kind oh, of yes, Hobbesian situation, yes. situation, right? So yes. then, 
then then I would say kind of okay what what can we do given that there's going to be this this kind of you know likely increasingly likely series of catastrophic global global events well we you know at the moment the cap the capitalist system is organized such that the that that the that a very few are able to withstand those shocks and the rest of us go go to hell right you know and like you you, you said okay uh, apocalypse themselves and really okay who are the who are the only who are the ones who 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 have prepared for the apocalypse right the 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 libertarians the, the, Rezo was right 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 so libertarians who build their bunkers right and and take their weapons and so on and also you know that you know that being the, the poor libertarians as well as super rich libertarians right so who who bought their places in new zealand so that when there's this collapse then they just go over to new zealand you know and there's there's lots of people going into bunkers right now to 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 escape this this yes, is the but like there was there was like protests and demonstrations in Long Island in places like Hamptons and Montauk because all the rich people are going going to their summer home and clearing up all the uh, grocery stores of all the supplies for locals who are like dude we're not expecting you till May or June what are you doing coming in now taking away all of our like food and resources just because you want to be away from the dirty New York that has become the center of the problem right but guys, you know, we're a little bit behind. Let's just move forward because David has been with us from the beginning. Absolutely. And I owe him an apology over not no, sending fine. the Pashinius only book, which I finally put it in mail and I have a proof to show that the slow German mail will bring you the book very soon. So David, yeah. go and I will, I will apply uh, appropriate sort of decontamination procedures to it yeah, when I receive it. Do so. Thank do you. So. Yeah, um, well, I, you know, I don't, I don't have a hot take on this. I'm still reeling from it. Um, I mean, in in uh, in Bristol, where I live, um, for example, the university was keeping open one of the libraries until we, I mean, we went into lockdown on um, on Monday. The university was keeping open one of the libraries because it didn't want students to feel isolated. <laughs> um, so, you know, we're in the middle of a very incoherent um, response at the moment. Um, and I, I mean, I think, I think my, my own, I, I suspect my own response will be similarly, in, reflect that in a way. I mean, I, I, think, I think the best I can do at this point is, is, is to um, field some questions really. Um, I, you know, as I said, I don't think I have a take on this yet. Um, I mean, one of, one of the themes that's sort of run through the conversation is, is this question of apocalypticism within culture. And it's like our culture kind of produces visions of apocalypse like some kind of exhaust. It, we're sort of suffused in it, and yet we're kind of struggling to kind of make sense of this. We're, most of the, uh, you know, much of Western Europe is struggling to develop an infrastructure. I mean, we still haven't got adequate testing for, um, for COVID-19 cases in this country. Um, most of the medical staff um, are, you know, haven't, haven't got adequate face masks yet. Um, so I guess it raises questions about, you know, the role of apocalypticism in culture. You know, what kind of apocalypse, is there a good apocalypticism? You know, is there a kind of apocalypticism in a sense which would in, in some way contribute, which would in some way make us more resilient? Okay, that, that's kind of, that's, I guess that's an aside. I think the other issue I want to, I, I was thinking about ahead of today's discussion was, was in, was the concept of resilience itself because I, th I think the idea the idea of the resilient society is going to become a central kind of theme of political discourse I mean that well I suspect that that may be the case it seems obvious um, and there seem to be some inherent dangers in that um, I mean there are different kinds of different concepts of resilience. So at a pinch, there's a kind of engineering sense of resilience, which is the, um, 
the, the degree to which a system can kind of um, recover from a per perturbation, which can, in a sense, resume its function after some kind of event um, displaces it from, from its normal function. Then there's a, a notion of ecological resilience, which refers to the capacity of a system to um, assume diverse multi-stable states. And I mean, it seems like some kind of ecological resistance. It seems like a sort of cuddly notion. It seems like something that we ought to value, that we ought to cultivate societies that, in a sense, can respond to, to these black swans in, in, in some kind of fluent way. Um, and I, I, I wonder, <laughs> I mean, I, th I think the problem with the problem with ecological resilience is that it's, in a sense, ethically blind. You know, I mean, for example, some, uh, you know, some kind of self-replicating AI that didn't need to live in an atmosphere would be more ecologically resistant than us, I guess. But we wouldn't want to. We wouldn't place value on that sort of state of a, a system. So I'm, I'm, I'm sort of interested in, in, in the extent to which the theme of resilience may kind of emerge as, as a political debate and, 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 and the kind of problems associated with that. Not all forms of resilience may be correspond to systems that we want to live under. For example, you know, we might, we probably wouldn't want, to, most of us probably wouldn't want to live under a system in which the state can use the location data from our phones to track us, even though you know that has been appears to have been used extremely successfully in in China to um, uh, trace and target um, sites of infection. Um, okay, so let's since we're kind of like short, maybe hold on to your thought. Let's bring Davor on, so we can catch up. I, actually, there he is. I thought he left. He left the screen. Okay, Davor, do you want to take over and maybe you know David's work? Kind of like overlaps a little bit with yours. So if he wants to interject and come in, it's totally fine. Go yeah, ahead. okay. Uh, can you hear me well so yes, far? Yes, very well. Okay. Uh, uh, hello, everybody. Uh, yeah, uh, Mo, Reza, and Valentin, thank you very much for organizing. <laughs> it's very strange. Not uh, it was me. Actually, the idea came yeah. from Valentin to do okay. an ongoing one. I just talked to Reza and I said, let's do a big one in the first session where we bring a lot of our instructors and other people in to yeah. make this public that we're going to be doing this on a weekly basis. So thanks to Valentin and thanks to Reza because it wouldn't have happened without them. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's a strange occasion, right? I mean, we are discussing the apocalypse. It doesn't happen many times in life, right? So uh, let's, um, yeah. So let's see how far we go, uh, we, we go with this. Yeah, so, let me just um, give an intro. You were going to bring in your knowledge yeah. of Black Death and kind mm -hmm. of related to like what's happening now. Yeah, like, exactly. Kind of technological yeah, exactly. So, uh, like, the Black Death kind yeah. of like, impose on us right go ahead yeah exactly so uh the problem is i didn't know what the format is uh, i thought it's going to be talks like real talks and therefore i pre uh, prepared a powerpoint presentation and i hope you don't mind if i do a powerpoint presentation about uh, the end of the world so to speak um uh, so i wanted to follow up on many many questions but i think we can you know we will uh, solve the problem at, uh, during my talk um so now i have to see if this works at all um, okay. Can you see something? All right. Yes, totally. Uh, okay. So the, the point is what I'm going to do now is I'm going to quickly, uh, I will not talk about the situation. Be quick. Go ahead. Everybody, yeah, everybody knows how the situation is in Germany, but I, I, I still want to share some thoughts about the general situation and then we will get to the plague. Okay. So. Um, all right, so uh, this is the idea, like uh, current situation, black death, new beginnings, certain stages in civilizational history, and then in the end, what are the potentials? What is the silver lining that we've been talking about, right, of this plague? Uh, can we even talk about this? Uh, I mean, can we, can we see a silver lining? Can we see, hmm. can we, not that I want to say that, that there's something good or positive in, in, uh, in this plague, but, um, yeah, what should I, say? should I say? The general potential of change from a historical perspective, right? Okay, so the current situation uh, to me looks like this. 
so we have four uh, scenarios. Um, there, there are many scenarios, but uh, uh, um, there are four formal ones that can be distinguished. And, and the first one is uh, of this whole process of, uh, um, yeah, okay, I, I'll just go quickly through the scenarios. So there's a fast process, long process, open process, and infinite process. So a little bit what we talked about already. So the fast process, uh, I call it the homo faber scenario, which means we will find a vaccine, a medication, and the whole thing is over in six months, right? It could be over next month already, if you want to. So, uh, I mean, if you find <laughs> if you find the vaccine. So uh, the consequences would be a short-term financial crisis, uh, local and national adaptions, uh, the establishment of a global warning system like emergency protocols, and of course, the, all the increase in uh, algorithmic control and, and big data and surveillance and so on. Uh, this crisis could even in the end be turned into a success of the current system, right? We would say, oh, look, we were so powerful, we were so capable of coming up with a vaccine. Now we can even continue uh, with capitalism or whatever it was in the end. Yeah, you know, it's, it's going to be even uh, supportive of the old system and not be uh, bad for it, so it's uh, detrimental. And then the next scenario is the, the one which is uh, more likely. Uh, this is the uh, surfing the curve or controlled buildup of herd immunity, uh, which will take around five years at least. So um, uh, you know what the problem is with the uh, <clears throat> with the with the uh, flattening the curve. The problem is that we have to keep the uh, um, critically ill people below the capacity of the uh, of the uh, health system, right? So here you can see. So if you don't do anything, then you will get so many critical uh, ill people and you have only so many capacities uh, um, to take care of them, right? So, and so the solution that they came up with, uh, and this is basically what every Western country does, even though we pretend uh, we don't do it. For example, when Trump says he's going to open uh, next week, uh, what did he say? In two weeks, people can go out on the streets again. Uh, this is nonsense. He's just, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, soothing his waters. Everybody knows nobody's going to go out on the street again. Uh, so the point is what we are doing is uh, we are trying to um, uh, uh, um, allow a wave of infections, then, you know, um, uh, extinguish it again, so to speak, and then allow it again to go up and then to extinguish it and then to go, uh, uh, to go up again to reach the plateau of the, of the maximum capacities all the time. So basically you have these waves, okay? So uh, I've, uh, I've calculated it. Uh, for Germany, uh, this would take 10 years, five years minimum. Five years, if you can constantly be on the maximum, but if you have waves, you're not constantly on the maximum of the capacities, okay? So this is the long process. And this is what uh, everybody's going for, like, you know, UK and France and, and everywhere. So this, you can call this the surfing the curve process. And if you do a little mistake, you go too high, you know, so this, but you cannot go too slow because you want to have the problem finished at some point, right? Uh, so uh, the developed uh, states will pay at all, but in general probably remain stable. The developmental states will collapse, like, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, there's, uh, there will be not much left of these states, so to speak. So, but still it would have a huge impact on uh, society in general. Sorry, uh, what do you mean by developmental states? You mean developing states, like, like... Oh, yeah, sorry if I didn't use the right term. Yeah, I meant like developing countries. Yes, yes, uh, sorry, I, I didn't use them. Uh, because as you know, we don't have anything. We don't have respirators, we don't have ventilators and stuff like this. Uh, we don't have tests, nothing. So um, or think of the situation in the refugee camps and so on. Anyway, so this will have a huge impact probably. And this is just, you know, I'm just uh, uh, speculating here. So of course we can, there, there are many other ramifications and consequences and so on. I'm, I'm just naming a few. So. The old rules and regulations may be replaced uh, in many fields. The old elite will also be dying. Uh, like if you have a, a process of 10 years, then Merkel, Trump, and all the other people will be history, right? So we have a new generation basically already. So- Davo, um, would, you, would you accept a question? Yes, please. Um, it's my understanding that Germany isn't trying to flatten the curve. Germany has been doing contact tracing from the start, which is... No, 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 this is just, uh, this is absolutely not true. We're doing, we're not doing anything in Germany, so there's no contact tracing. Uh, if you want to go to... But isn't the official line that they've been doing, the containment effort has included contact tracing from day yeah, one? No, no, we, no, we started to do that, like, recently, but in the beginning, we didn't do anything. And still, if you call them and you say you have contacted somebody, they wouldn't allow you to a test. So there are many people who, who are saying uh, that they weren't allowed to go for testing uh, currently. So... 
So it looks right. like the strategy is to controllably uh, spread the infection to a certain level and then to uh, you know uh, uh, press it down again and then to open it up again and then to press, press it down again. So this, that's how it looks like in Germany. So you don't think the effort will develop into a containment effort? No. Because they're currently trying to hire... They're currently trying to hire quite a few people to do contact tracing, obviously. Yeah, yeah, we have public. to at some point. Yes, 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 I know, I know we have to at some point, but uh, but we also have to, you know, we have to, uh, basically we have to produce a Laplacian de de demon, you know. We have to produce a demon that sees every molecule, you know, uh, every element, every individual, how it moves in order to predict, to be, to be able to control the infections and to lower them again, you know. I mean, the Chinese did it, so we have a model, so. Yeah. Why wouldn't other developed states just follow the model? Uh, no, no. The, the point is, you have to go to herd immunity because uh, if you contain it now, uh, it will flare up again in a month, and then you start from the beginning. Right. So that's the reason. So you think that's what will happen in China? Yeah, of it's course. It's already yeah. happening, but China, yeah, this, we don't trust yeah, of, of course. So I, then, I mean, uh, whatever. I, I believe that the Chinese kind of contained it a little bit, but it's impossible that they say that there are no new uh, infections. Uh, it's, it's just. But, uh, but herd immunity is also a false narrative, isn't it? Because you need sixty to seventy percent of the population yeah, to catch it. That's the problem. Exactly. This is the problem with the. Right. Uh, sorry, continue. Is, I didn't want to. No, no sorry. This much. is exactly the the, the problem with uh, with this with this model. Uh, if you want to go to herd immunity, it will take you five years. You see. This is, uh, and, and uh, that's why I said this is- So uh, lots of people are gonna die. I don't know if you've done the uh, equivalent modeling, but maybe you get more fatalities. Yeah, yeah, uh, sure. Uh, that's, that's the point. I mean, you, you cannot change it right now. So this is the, the uh, yeah, okay. Well, of course, this of, of course is a capitalism and a neoliberalism. The country which emerges out of the crisis first is going to win, of course, right? So th that's the reason why you have to keep on infect people, but not too many, so to speak. Uh, and, and a containment, um, uh, a containment isn't possible uh, because, as I said, you can contain everything, but then in two months you will have another outbreak, and everything we started, uh, you know, will be reset to zero again. So this is the this is the problem. Yeah, Davor, continue on because we're a little bit behind, and I okay. really would like to bring Alan in as soon yeah. as possible because he's been waiting patiently from the beginning for his slot, which was delayed okay. by at least an hour. Mm, yeah, well, uh, uh, okay. Well, but, but also, Jesse's here, and Jesse might have a question from you. So why don't we just let Jesse ask a question, and then you summarize in your response to Jesse. Go ahead, Jesse. Thanks so much for joining. Okay. Hello. Okay. Hi, hi, Davo. Yeah. Uh, thanks for asking to um, to pose a question. Um, I kind of because uh, I kind of started as soon as I saw Davo's uh, uh, index anyway because I was going to ask pretty much exactly those questions um, because I was kind of familiar. Uh, I kind of had an assumption of where Davo was going um, in this sense. So one of the questions was, which you've kind of already answered, was: Is this actually a black swan? Like, is it a civilizationally, anthropologically important event? that could be compared to the peasant revolt? Um, or is uh, late capitalism in that sense absorbent, which is kind of the homophaba scenario you've laid out, whereas this could be even a success story for the current system. Um, but then I'm kind of wondering, isn't it also uh, feasible to think that it might, uh, we might get stuck in this second uh, long process of surfing the curve but it still turns out to be a success story. And what would be like the the, the smaller modulations or things that could happen in that in that tale? So I would just I would just be curious what you what you okay okay so thanks so no many things yeah, can... that also maybe finish your four points because people are like really expecting to you to tell us the three and four. So go yes, ahead. Yes, I know, I know. Uh, that's uh, just wanted to say exactly. So many things can happen. Uh, let me just continue. You will see. Okay, so. Um, uh, am I, uh, do you still see the PowerPoint presentation? Yeah, of see? course. That's the main screen is your PowerPoint. Go ahead. Okay, so then uh, just just for fun, uh, the other scenario, we don't have to go in detail. So this is the perma crisis. The, the virus keeps uh, mutating, you know, and then things go go very bad and there's, there's an open end. We don't know what to do. And uh, then we have the Mad Max scenario, which is the infinite process, uh, total collapse, uh, you know, of all the state systems and, and, and technology and so on. Okay, so the question is now, can the coronavirus virus historically be considered as a catalyzer of transition? Um, 
uh, transition out of modernity, out of, uh, of, of capitalism into another type of society, so to speak. So if you talk about scenarios, perma crisis and Mad Max, uh, there's nothing left. It doesn't make sense. So we have to talk about the scenarios which are likely, which are currently happening. So this, you know, 1.5, 2.5, surfing the curve and, and finding a vaccine, so to speak. So this would not be a total collapse, but it would be a, a considerable uh, burst to the system. Um, yeah, so we would have the real uh, disruption of societal reproduction and of path dependency uh, by this coronavirus. And then we would need new models uh, from left explorationism and Fridays for Future. This is basically a chance. Uh, you know, if these people want to be serious, then this is the only chance we have because uh, the, uh, there's never again going to happen something uh, uh, like th th that the systems are disrupted as with this virus. Okay, so this is uh, this is what uh, what I want to basically communicate here. Um, uh, so the first priority would be to put a wedge between the old and the new, you know, world. And why? Because everybody will do that. Uh, the left will do that. The right will do that. The the uh, the companies will do that. The you know the capitalists will do that. So everybody will fight for the future in this moment. So what uh, what we have now that we need to um, yeah put a put a gap between the old and the new. Anyway, so what I wanted to uh, show quickly is how this uh, panned out in the in the Middle Ages uh, in the Black Death, how Black Death uh, catalyzed the transformation to modernity. So it will take five more minutes or something like this. Yeah. Uh, so the general history, there were a lot of plagues uh, uh, of, of uh, there were a lot of plagues, uh, bubonic uh, plagues in history. Uh, the, the big one, the, the, Euro, the one that was so influential on Europe, uh, happened in, in 3047 to 1351 and it occurred in many, many waves, so to speak. It was basically cleansing Europe over centuries. It came back and back and back. Uh, so there was, for example, the big plague of London in 65 and so on. Uh, so this uh, famous, you know, the doctors with the big, uh, big masks, uh, we are actually a, um, a phenomenon of the 17th century, not, not of the 13th century. So it's, um, in other words, the plague was there all the time, but today we don't, uh, we're not aware so much of this anymore. Anyway, so the last plague pandemic was actually lead, uh, until 1960. And today still we have um, occasionally some cases. Okay, so now let's look at, uh, uh, at Europe, what happened. The origin was probably in Mongolia. It was brought to Europe by ships from Kaffa and uh, it killed 30% of the population. In some areas, 80 or even 90% of the population. So the cause, as you know, is the bacterium uh, Yersinia pestis uh, discovered in 1894. So for 700 years, nobody knew what's causing this uh, the sickness, right? But it's a big difference compared to today. Today we know what's, what's causing these kind of uh, pandemia. So, uh, the bacterium enters the body, uh, reproduces, and the dead bacteria release poison. This is what makes you sick. And the mortality rate is pretty high, uh, like, yeah, something between 60 and whatever, 100%. Um, and uh, the, the symptoms, uh, one of the reasons why it's called the Black Death is that uh, uh, you get a bleeding skin, you know, and you get necrosis, and then you get these black dots on, on the body. So, uh, but today it's super easily treatable with simple antibiotics. So the infection chains also very late uh, in 1897, people finally realized or understood uh, that the infection chains are uh, rats and then flea and then humans, right? Or humans and then flea and then human or human to human. So anyway, so the, um, okay, I will skip the trivia. Well, maybe there's, uh, there's an interesting trivia down there. Uh, so uh, according to some theories, the outbreak in 13, 34 took place in the Chinese province Hubei, right? The same one as uh, today, killing 80% of, of the population. Yeah. Anyway. Now, course, some people also contend that the Spanish flu began in central China, but that's another story. Yeah, it could be. I don't know. I mean, yeah, the, the theory is always, it's a little bit difficult to, uh, to you know, verify. Um, anyway, so, okay, these are just general uh, intro to the, to the plague. So now new beginnings. Uh, I just want to quickly um, uh, show you the parallelity or the uh, analogy even of the situation in the beginning of the 14th century to the 20th century to today. Okay, so there are some there are some similarities. So in the beginning, so we had uh, the beginning of modernity. The onset is the feudal or commercial and agrarian 
uh, revolution. Uh, so we have the feudal revolution with with um, with a new society which was based on writing, uh, writing in the sense of written constitutions uh, that would bind small units together. You, you could be a kingdom, you could be a monastery, uh, which which is based on the on on written on a written constitution. So you get this many many little uh, political units in Europe. Uh, then we had the commercial re revolution, which is the reintroduction of uh, of, of money and the trade and uh, merchants city arising. Um, and then you get the agrarian revolution at the same time. We have the free field system and the yoke and iron plow mills and in general, the compound machine is appearing. Okay, so we have a huge increase uh, in productivity and population due to these changes which happened at this time. So this is the onset basically of modernity, but we are not yet in modernity. And um, the 14th century was already called the century of turmoil um, because the, uh, so there was a lot of chaos. So, uh, um, you have conflicts between all kinds of political units. The church was falling apart for a while. There were even three popes. Uh, there were re reformatory movements uh, already happening. Uh, you have an unba uh, unbalanced uh, distribution of goods. Cities become powerful, autonomous units. Uh, merchants gain power. And then you have also the new uh, technologies, new, new economic te technologies like modern credit insurance and bank accounts and so on. Um, so the point so is how do you this. compare this to what's happening like how do you use this this yeah. like past information yeah I, i'll show you i'll show you I'll show you just in the next one so the point is this the feudal institutions were developed in uh, around 900 1000 in, in this time right and uh but they were so successful that you had a huge population growth up to 90 million from 25 to 90 million within three centuries or something like that. so the point is uh, the, uh, the institutions were developed for a population of 25 million, not for 90 million. So the feudal institutions already could not reduce the new complexities any longer. Okay, so we were not um, we were not sufficient to organize the people anymore. Um, so there were no means uh, to balance the effects of population and productivity growth. So what I'm saying is uh, that the um, that the institutions were outdated at this time. Okay, and the point is that today's institutions like democracy, uh, 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 capitalism, and so on, they are also 250 years old. They were developed in a different technological stage with uh, less humans, uh, with different media, and uh, they cannot uh, be applied for today's, uh, they, they cannot be used for today's problems simply. Yeah. Um, so th this is a parallel or an analogy in, in that case, uh, in, in that sense, so to speak, uh, that we have the same. Uh, the, the same problems currently. So uh, the impact of the plague, I'll just show you quickly what the impact of the plague is. So you have the, sur the surge in population and then uh, the plague kills like two, two thirds or one third, depending on where you are. And uh, then slowly after hundred years or something, it continues. And then the exponential growth of population, which already started in the ninth, ninth, uh, ninth century uh, continues basically. So you can see this here on the world, world population, the, the uh, uh, it, it, it started, or the, so the, the, the developments started already in uh, much earlier and it just continued after the plague as they were. So the effects of the plague, we have a huge depopulation, of course, decrease of productivity, starvation and inflation. Then of course the whole genocides and uh, with, with the Jews. And uh, what, what is also new, all of a the sudden there's a distrust in authorities, okay. So the consequences of the plague, it had a leveling effect. Uh, land to labor ratio changed. So that means uh, you had more labors than land, uh, the other way around, you had more land than, than labors, right? And uh, that also means that the land owner had less power all of a sudden compared to the worker. And then you had an overabundance of food basically uh, because you had less people but more, uh, yeah, uh, more, more food and more land available in the end. And the most important thing is that it was the end of serfdom. Why? Uh, because workers became self-confident and started bargaining wages, basically. And uh, then the first labor laws were uh, instigated yeah, in 38 because we had to control the... And you have also a new distribution of uh, new, new, new ways of distribution, distri distributing uh, um, wealth by inheritance laws. All of a sudden it was not the first son of the family anymore who would inherit something, but it was all sons and daughters. Yeah. So basically you can, you can call it a management 
revolution, the labor laws came, the bourgeois structure um, uh, expanded, bureaucracy expanded significantly and so on. So in an, um, uh, what's also important, you have a new informational regime because now the public sphere uh, uh, was uh, becoming um, informed, informed, so to speak. So the, the politicians had to inform the, the, the population about what we are doing. Um, Okay, so this is uh, some general consequences. And uh, the mental psychological consequences, uh, the objectification. So we have the objectification of the other. All of a sudden, the other person is um, uh, is a material object, right? It's not, it's not a father anymore, not the mother, not the child, not the sister, but all of a sudden, it's just an object. And if the person is infected, you have to go away from this person. You cannot get close to this person, right? Same as we have today with... Um, uh, yeah, with social distancing, basically, but it's not not as bad as it was at this time. And then we have also an increase of abstraction, uh, or you have to deal with an invisible enemy, uh, um, and uh, the laws and lawmakers become more and more abstract, and the long term plan planning and so on. Right. So in the arts, you have a shift towards realism. Uh, in and the architecture uh, t t takes a shift towards uh, beauty, so to speak. Uh, so it was uh, not about, um, how should I say, it was not about uh, presenting the sublime anymore, but more about beauty. Yeah. And uh, yeah. And, and uh, again, uh, uh, yeah. Davor, mm -hmm. we're, we're out of time. Like, just please relate it a little bit more to present so we can. Yes, we yes, can, yes. You know, like, okay. So I mean, you're triggering a lot of great stuff to be put in a particular order to think as a consequence of Black Plague. It's yes, great. Yeah. And also, people are asking because they want you to share their share your PowerPoint for later, further kind of like contemplation. If you can send it to me, we can make it available to the other. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I, I, I go fast now. I mean, I'm at the end closely actually. So the, the point is, uh, the Black Death accelerated uh, already existing tendencies which were there already, right? So, but the point is, we were stuck in a in a uh, yeah, we were in a, in a lock in basically. They couldn't get out of feudal of the feudal path dependence. And then uh, when the play came, it catalyzed the system transition simply because it posed problems that had to be solved with new means, which would have been, which should have been developed anyway, uh, but they couldn't because they couldn't get out of the path dependency basically. Okay, so this is how the plague uh, accelerated at least the onset of modernity. So, I mean, I made it now very quick. I'm sorry, it was very superficial, but uh, yeah, you know. Uh, it was great. And now, now I just, I just wish you would like, you, I wish to save yeah. some of the time to talk about this, yes. like, uh, this no, like a, like a yeah. premature modernity or how it forced modernity, but we really have to move to Alan because he's been mm -hmm. waiting for a long time. But stick around because there might be time for you to just maybe address some other stuff if you can. Okay. Uh, wait a second, so you're cutting me off now? What, what's happening? Kind of. Oh, okay, okay. Now, well, um, let me just show you one more slide and then I'm No done. problem. Can I? Yes, of course. Yes, go okay. ahead. Okay, look now, the point is now this. Uh, so if you look at civilizational history, then uh, you see that there's uh, certain stages. You can speak of the early cultures, uh, then of uh, the, uh, the exil age, and then of modernity, and you can define them as uh, stages, um, uh, uh, as distinct stages which are building up on each other. And if you look at the uh, current technological developments, you see uh, that from 1870 on, we have a new stage which has been termed the uh, technological civilization, which is building up on modernity. Okay, so this. Uh, just uh, so what I'm saying now, um, I'll make it short. I'll skip some things. Um, so you can look at uh, you can look at modernity and uh, put it in such a diagram where you see all the phenomena of modernity from the beginning up to today, how we're building up on each other in a cumulative way. Okay. So uh, and um, uh, I've called this uh, the cones of realization. Okay. So everything that happened in modernity happened totally logically um, from the beginning up to today. So. And um, now, starting in 1870, we are entering maybe the technological civilization which opens a new cone of uh, realization. Okay, so this is my point now. And what I'm saying is that the Black Death uh, was the onset of modernity in the 14th century and accelerated the uh, realization of the cone of realization of modernity. And what I'm saying is that Corona could be exactly the same bifurcation point. Okay. I did. I didn't think you would end in such a positive note, but this is this is great. I hope you're right. Okay, you see my point. So do you mind oh. returning it to the screen? So, thank you so much, man. And sorry if we're running short of time. 
but mm -hmm. please stick around because there might be a way for you to interject again. Can we go to Alan, please? I've been waiting for him to speak for like three hours and a half. Um, yes. Alan, go ahead. The floor is yours. Can you hear me? Yes. I still remember your incredible presentation in my program in Amsterdam in 2016 and how you shook those white Dutch people with what you put on the screen, which basically became so important a few months later with the election of Trump, but go ahead. Okay, so what I want to uh, speak to is some of the uh, discourses that we heard today, and I thank everybody for that, and but also to, uh, to think more politically about the medical situation. Um, I just returned, uh, yesterday I taught my politics of the gays class to uh, my graduate students uh, who 90% are Chinese. And the majority of them are Chinese from the mainland and the rest are Chinese Americans. And uh, there's some Koreans as well and Japanese uh, who will be mistaken for Chinese. And I am concerned for their safety, not in, in terms of the uh, coronavirus, but in terms of Trump's racialization of, of, of the virus. And I want to uh, argue that uh, uh, this, this event has traumatized Trumpism and that we can only expect violence emerging from that in the sense that Trump's political program was based on an immunitarian uh, paradigm or project or program, which was, you know, uh, America first, make America great again, and uh, solidify the borders, uh, uh, relying on the borders as a human, um, an autoimmune uh, uh, shield uh, that will allow America to become first and great again. Uh, and the virus has completely de-reified that, that whole program, uh, showing it to be uh, 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 totally, total phantasmagoria. And we discussed Lacan earlier on, you know, in Lacan, when the real that resists representation uh, breaks through and intrudes on the symbolic order uh, and begins to render it dysfunctional. And here I associate the border with the symbolic order and the border with national identity because that national identity in the States has moved to the border since 9-11. Trump has exploited that shift um, and uh, the destruction of this humanitarian, this inhumanitarian uh, war, uh, I mean, um, wall, um, uh, Trump has resorted to the imaginary which, you know, in Lacan, the imaginary sutures, the rupture between the real and the symbolic order. And part of that imaginary, one aspect of that is the racialization and orientalization of the virus. The other part is this deployment of this discourse of herd immunity, which as deployed by uh, uh, Boris Johnson, keeping the schools open far too long in the UK. Um, and uh, as hinted tacitly, hinted by Trump who wants to return to business as usual sometime around Easter. Uh, the, both these uh, autocrats, um, proto-fascist autocrats, are relying on this sacrificial discourse of her, um, of her uh, and practice of herd immunity, which we're told doesn't make medical sense, but it makes political sense in the sense that it saves capitalism, okay? Um, and also saves the elite who can protect themselves. And, uh, and, this, and this sacrificial- It only, like, time will show if it will do what it's supposed to be doing, I guess, right? Because time is the risk that Trump and these people are taking with this. I don't, you know, the thing is we have to separate functionality from symbolic, uh, symbolic efficacy. Herd immunity fulfills a certain symbolic efficacy. Who's going to flock into the shops and restaurants once they're reopened around Easter in, in, in the United States? It's going to be certain generations, right? Uh, and there's going to be a certain collateral damage. This is a, another discourse of collateral damage. So I want to suggest that we're going to see a fusion of herd immu immunity and algorithmic governmentality, uh, and that we're going to see a version of state triage based on a concept of flexible citizenship where certain people become, certain citizens become forms of disposable uh, life. Um, and uh, the way I want to make sense of this is, um, uh, is through the Schmidtian uh, concept or binary or opposition between the Catacon and the Eschaton. And I think that, you know, 
Trump as a Schmidtian sovereign who was reliant on the friend enemy binary, over reliant, uh, is deploying this, you know, without understanding the concepts. But catacon it, it means to restrain. It stems from the Latin restingere, which means first and foremost to hold back, to withhold. It could also mean to bind back, to put in chains, or figuratively to put in limits, or simply to limit. To restrain implies that something that would otherwise continue to perform or execute its negative force has been arrested. Put differently, the ray of, a string, of restringere references a force that has been counted, countered, yet whose presence is required to dramatize it, uh, to dramatize its containment for political ends. In political theology, what the catacomb seeks to restrain, delay, defer, and withhold is the advent of an apocalyptic eschaton, which can be defined as uncovering disclosure of hidden inequity, contamination. More than that, the act of deferring and restraining catacomb means to contain, limit, and to compass its antithesis within itself. And that's where the juncture at which I begin to understand the deployment of controlled contamination through this notion of uh, this political model of herd immunity. Um, deterring com uh, containment in prisons and holds captive what it opposes, uncovering disclosure of hidden inequity. More than the act of deferring and restraining, Katakan means to contain, limit, and compass its antithesis within itself. Containment as deterrence is a positivizing power, deterring containment in prisons and host captive what it opposes. So I think we're seeing the state instrumentalize and begin to deploy uh, communicability um, uh, uh, of the virus uh, to salvage uh, the capitalist infrastructure um, and get it and to kickstart it again. Um, and uh, this is also a corresponds to Bataille's notion of alienated so uh, sovereignty, which in which the wastage of catastrophe uh, is something that the sovereign addresses, but also is mirrored in sovereign practices, which begins to sacrifice human resources in order to reproduce itself in time and space. So this is the very sad and black uh, model that I want us to begin uh, thinking, thinking about. And we do have the toolkit. Uh, to work with that. And what I, what I was trying to do with my predominantly Chinese students was to use this, um, use this essay I published in 2007 to make sense of 9-11, uh, uh, the war on terror, and also the resurgent uh, repression of undocumented migrants and asylum seekers at that time, uh, was the notion of the sleeper body that has to be rendered visible, the mole-like agent, which you know, links terrorist, undocumented immigrants, uh, uh, viruses, and unwanted forms of globalized circulation. Uh, and it's important for these students to have uh, toolkits. And most of these Chinese students are uh, been thoroughly depoliticized by their political culture on the, on the mainland. And now they find themselves uh, thrown into a racialized, ethnicized, and orientalized, um, highly politicized situation. They're still mainly based here in the States. And as I said, I, I think that they're facing certain levels of risk. And we're going to see other disposable communities. Uh, so uh, the issue that was raised earlier about there is no subject I thoroughly disagree with. I think uh, uh, who or what becomes subjectified uh, shifts and has shifted. And you know, citing that famous book, Who Comes After the Subject, I would argue it's the immune system. And one of the experiences I had, and I agree with Joelle, when I worked on AIDS uh, uh, infection among homeless here in New York, is that immune systems become stratified and privileged. And, and become a new form of classist and racist uh, uh, hierarchy. Uh, and so immune systems are now the subject and our immune systems uh, as that which in interfaces our life with the virus uh, has become the intruder. And again, this model of uh, uh, Immu uh, herd immunity is about the instrumentalization of immune systems in terms of age uh, cohorts where people in my age group are basically disposable forms of life. Um, so also people with quote unquote underlying conditions, right? Like because that is itself part of this immunity sort of like paradigm. People over 50 in general, 
you know, uh, are, are seen as having weakened immune systems because of their age. Of their Basically, age. the OK Boomer people couldn't find like a worst nightmare of their wishes coming through. Yeah, but I think Trump's uh, attempt to restore uh, uh, um, uh, the, the commodity culture is addressing certain age populations, as was uh, Johnson's attempt to keep the school system open longer than uh, was possible. I think the other issue that we have to think about is the concept of la bête, you know, the beast, uh, what Derrida called the beast and the sovereign, and uh, this, and also la bête in, in French means stupidity. So we're dealing with imbecilic epidemiology coming from people like Johnson, Bolsonaro, and, and Trump, and even my own university, which said, we're gonna close on Wednesday, but we want you to attend meetings on Monday and Tuesday, particularly to get trainings on how to use Zoom, uh, as if Monday and Tuesday were safer days than Wednesday. So this attempt to kind of draw these artificial boundaries around uh, uh, risk and threat uh, as part of this imbecilic sovereignty we're dealing with. And of course, as already discussed, Biden is another uh, harbinger or avatar of, of uh, a new version of this imbecilic sovereignty that will be incapable of addressing the virus, except by you know sacrificing disposable forms of life. And I'll stop here. Uh, Adnan, do you would you like to make an interjection? Because I thought this and then and then also Aiken after you, the two Turkish dudes in the room. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Do you guys hear me clearly? Yes. Okay. I mean, I'm a big fan of Ellen. So this. Uh, the question around Corona as a political incident, so how it teaches us the concept of contingency uh, has been turned into a great discussion, but following Ellen's practice, uh, I just want to go back to an interview and about archives of insensibility, he was talking about the bodies and the state, and maybe he himself has forgotten it already, but I would like to bring this, uh, this discussion about how uh, the state no longer maintains borders, external or internal, and rather the precarious border that maintains the state itself. So uh, I think the border no longer contains or expands or inflates or consumes bodies that border the border. So it becomes a neurologic, nomadic, insecure, and also the paranoid for its own liquefaction. I mean, these are Ellen's words, and I think it's very meaningful to remember this in completely another context. As a curator, uh, what I can offer to a group of intellectuals around the table about coronavirus, first of all, we have, uh, we have sadly uh, missed Morris, uh, who is a great thinker. Morris Berger, I would like to immediately remember here, but also uh, Terence, Manu, there are a lot of people, also Queen uh, Mona, we have lost in the last few days. So uh, I'm not a big fan of uh, the uh, curatorial approach from Christoph Bakargiev, but she made a very important public statement yesterday on Freeze magazine asking, we might lose a generation. I mean, I know Ben is very sensitive about connecting HIV and Corona discussions in a parallel line, but I, I refrain from this reading these histories in a in a kind of uh, parallel lines, but rather than that, we have to be very very careful. We might lose a huge collective memory of a very important generation. So this is just a, a warning. And besides, uh, uh, there is there is one important note I need to make. Recently, also we miss. Uh, we lose uh, lost uh, Genesis or Bridge uh, or Rich, uh, and she said they humans have to realize they are not individuals, but individual parts of the same organism with responsibility to each other. Of course, uh, we we, we read things. Uh, sorry, I respond to the first part of the question about the board. Please, please. What? What you see Trump doing when he's talking about the Chinese virus is that he's creating a new border, encapsulating it in racial categories, because the national border has been thoroughly decimated and uh, destroyed. And the, other, and the other aspect of herd immunity is that what I've argued in Archives and Insensible, and also in another interview I did with another Turkish scholar, uh, is that the border becomes embodied and personified in particular bodies, which have to be subject to forms of state violation and intervention, 
uh, management and control, like the undocumented immigrant uh, uh, you know, and the, the, the asylum seeker. So borders are definitely mobile, they're virtual, uh, they're, they're digital, but uh, the borders are also being exported out of the United States into frontier zones like Afghanistan, you know, uh, through war or uh, Iraq or West Africa in the war on terror. And now I think we, we see the internalization of the border within the U.S. population, within its kind of um, uh, demographic uh, uh, cohorts, where certain cohorts uh, uh, can basically be sacrificed, you know, to save uh, the capitalist political economy. So yes, there is, I mean, I, again, I agree with the work of someone like E.O. Weitzman when he talks about the border in the West Bank, that there is no continuous border. It's just a series of border devices. And that's where we have to begin seeing political intervention disguised as biomedical intervention as the exercise of certain border devices. And to, and this is what Derrida has called in, um, philosophy in the time of terror, an autoimmune disorder where democracy in order to save itself will sacrifice itself. Thank you. Uh, Aiken, do you want to? Yes, wanna... yes, yes. Of course. Thank you so no, much, uh, Alan and everybody, really. Um, so we have, you know, a few Middle Easterners here, uh, Riza, Mohamed, myself, um, other Turkish scholars. And I just want to read what Erdogan translating this into English, what he just said 30 minutes ago. Uh, we have prepared for every scenario, Erdogan told the televised address to the Turkish nation. By breaking the speed of the viruses spread in two to three weeks, we will get through this period as soon as possible with as little damage as possible. So this reverberates exactly, you know, the rhetoric that we heard uh, from Trump, of course, uh, and that we heard even from, you know, someone who's now being touted as the Democrat par excellence, um, Governor Cuomo, who've been insisting on this Easter date. Uh, there's all kinds of theological resonances, of course, uh, but that things within this period must get back to normal, showing how expandable uh, you know, the at-risk populations in particular, but really all of us who occupy at least a certain class strata are. So by keeping that in mind, I want us to also speak about some and ask about some very specific things that we, and by we, I mean all of us, but particularly those of us perhaps in uh, politically uh, galvanized situations that are still uh, you know quite rudimentary but we may be able to develop them in this moment what we can do I think this is an important moment to sort of speak about specifics um, and this has also been sort of what has been lost in a lot of Agamben, and Zizek and other speculative philosophies that uh, frankly the analytic philosophers have been a little bit better about they've been speaking about meta ethics and about you know is it ethical barring that it's probably never ethical, but especially now is it ethical to imprison people uh, because uh, not only you know, is it always unethical, but the spread and the conditions uh, in places that uh, you know, are contained as federal prisons and uh, pretrial being held off as there is this proposition by the Department of Justice and so on. This is one specific concern. Another is a transition possibly to municipal owned utilities with electricity, the internet. In the Senate age package, uh, there were billions that were uh, allocated for Boeing today. So the question is the airline industry, particularly Boeing is getting a huge bailout. Is there any possibility that these become nationalized? Uh, and this prods us closer to something akin to MMT uh, not full socialism, I understand this, but also whether modern monetary theory can be a bridge to a more Marxist uh, cooperative orientation, um, you know, expansionary stimulative policies that MMT can bring out. There is this apothegm, never let a good crisis go to waste. Well, the right is certainly not letting this go to waste. Now, Mo, I know you, what you said is right. I mean, it's a brilliant point about the film, uh, Contagion, but I, I fear that there were some forecasting measures that certain, certain strata were aware of. I mean, a few congressmen, as you may have heard, sold their stock in the first week of February. This means that they're forecasting that their uh, algorithmic work 
which they were getting informed somehow, had been already in process for yep, at least- I already had watched the film and the fact was that the media was not telling us that they sold their stocks. We come with a delay. Right. So the question becomes how intentional is this? Probably quite intentional. Um, these four people profited quite lucrously. Another concept, and I'll end it at this, but I'd like to, well, two that are related. One is the possibility of a global debt jubilee, which means debt elimination and maybe even particularly student debt elimination. Now, this is not because, you know, our America is at all gracious, but this would be an economic incentive to them. So we really have to incentivize matters for, you know, those leaders in order to even prod closer to nationalization. And but another is collective it, it, What you need to also do is tell us about those radical ideas like rent strike, and more that's the, that's the last one I was going to say collective rent strike now historically rent strikes have been very difficult to actualize uh, because there are so many different kinds of buildings in different cities that it's hard to really nationalize these types of movements the last major one in America to my knowledge was during the 70s and it was squelched very quickly but now we have social media we have internet we very well can print out a piece of paper saying everyone joined this Facebook group and put it on the door of an apartment building and, you know, consolidate- Britney Spears already did it. Well, I don't know about Britney Spears, but you know, this seems like one viable means. So Alan, I know that there were a lot of little ideas, maybe you have more, but I, I want to also be able to think of something concrete that in these next weeks, months and so forth, I and, you know, other leftists in New York, America, international and so on can begin to think about bringing theory to action. Yeah, but in order to affect social change, you have to engage the state. And if we don't have an analysis of, of the state, um, it, 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 we will run up against its, its forms of resistance and preemption. Um, uh, one of the problems I have with the work of someone like Zizek or Badu is that there is no theory of the state coming out of their work. And the state has changed. The state has become, through the war on terror and other practices, the state has become uh, multi-centric, uh, plural, uh, based on structural dis disavow, uh, deniability, and, and collateral damage is not a side effect of the war on terror. It's actually the, the prime motivation. And I, what I'm suggesting is we're now seeing the state deploy uh, a, a, a a practice or a, a plan or policy of collateral damage internal within the internal boundaries of the United States. So uh, this to me is, is an issue. And uh, I'm here I would cite, and I'm sorry that our Macedonian friend is gone because she probably knows about her, but uh, the work of uh, the um, Serbian sociologist and feminist, Jirana Popic, who talked about the uh, progressive fascization of everyday life. I think this is, one of the things that the coronavirus is, is going to uh, encourage and uh, facilitate um, at the level of micro type of political entity. So how can these community-based initiatives deal with that, deal with surveillance, deal with policing, um, uh, deal with metadata acquisition, deal with facial recognition programs? Right now in Russia, they're using facial recognition programs as a form of contact uh, tracing and as a form of making sure that people who have been tested positive are not circulating in, in public. Thank you so much, Alan. Uh, okay, so Anil, are you there? We got two more guests and probably like a lot more conversation, but like we're going to like, we already have, mm, we're actually, we were supposed to end at 8.30 and it's about 8.50. So I guess we're 20 minutes behind. Go ahead and you'll actually know 20 and, oh, almost an hour behind. Go ahead and you'll. Yeah, um, I don't really have a particular theory to advance. Um, maybe I have some comments on what other people have said because we've had some. Absolutely. Some things come up. Uh, could start with you, um, Mohammed. I think maybe at the start, you were speaking about AI, our inability to predict the scenario that seems to be a kind of damning kind of indictment of, say, machinic intelligence, which, you know, for those that don't know me, that's my background. So as a kind of practitioner of, uh, of AI, as a programmer of this stuff, um, of course, predictive models are always statistical, they're probabilistic, and uh, this generation of deep learning tools 
has nowhere near like the purchase you would need to try and actually uh, predict the temporal uh, kind of uh, emanation over the pandemic like this. We only have broad, high-level statistical uh, notions as to the probability of such things. But obviously, obviously, obviously tech industry has, has, has its spokespeople. There are people like, there are capitalists like Bill Gates, who's been putting a lot of money into advocating for pandemic response funds, but, but ultimately hasn't been able to advance that through the state. So you could say if the tech industry in the US um, uh, was a stronger lobbying force, there may have, e there may have even been uh, more movement on that in some jurisdictions, but- um, Let's go back to the theory side, right? We had SARS and we had H1N1. And don't you think that those incidents earlier on in the 21st century would have given our statistical engines something to chew on, to come up with something? Absolutely. I, and at a high level, I think everyone would tell you it's highly likely for a global pandemic to emerge in X amount of time, 10 years. No, but not years only telling board. us to emerge, but tell us what we need to do in order to, to, to like, like, you know, stockpile masks, stockpile, like, uh, uh, rubbing alcohol, like ventilators. I mean, none of that happened, right? Because these yes, things- Yes, but mo modeling won't tell you that. Modeling, uh, policymakers need to decide what to do with that kind of output. Obviously, the reason none of that happened is pretty simple. I think we all understand. Uh, this comes back to Inigo's point about pricing. You know, what is this reluctance of capital to price these externalities? Well, the one thing these externalities have in common, say this virus and the climate, they're essentially ecological externalities. Now, capital cannot think through ecology, right? Capital has this kind of uh, flaw that it can't handle the ecosystem it's embedded in. Uh, it's a kind of almost Gedalian uh, flaw in, the, in that system and uh, will ultimately be its downfall. Its downfall won't be Marxist theory or anything like it. Uh, these are just merely, uh, you know, revolution will be merely be a symptom of an ecological uh, externality taking down uh, the blind spot of our, our economic uh, uh, fundaments. Now, the reluctance of capital to price in ecology is pretty simple. It would completely collapse overnight if it priced it in because steak of beef would be $500. Uh, demand would collapse, supply would then collapse and everything would just collapse. So we kind of know why we don't have pandemic response in place. You know, it's, it's, it's pretty simple, but it's also a little lazy to just say, oh, it's capital. So perhaps we do need, as Alan's saying, a stronger theory of the state here to try and understand why the state is so weak at this moment in history. Uh, we have obviously a, a bunch of theory on ne neoliberalism that helps us that. What's been interesting in this whole situation is just how how insignificant continental philosophy is at this moment in history. This, this event has been a kind of test of a number of different systems. Now it's a test of uh, 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 nation state politics, all confronted with the same foe uh, and they're all responding in slightly uh, different ways in different variations. And that really tells us a lot about the ideological basis of the political systems in place at this moment in history. So, you know, the UK showed a lot of courage. It's come out with the only truly eco-fascist genocidal response, you know, and it's very proud. And um, so you- Also you culturally, like the right. contagion, like culturally, like if you are a social culture, immediately the level of, uh, uh spread how it being spread is very different i think it also like a turn oil paper it became a uh, it became a kind of uh lenses that we look through yes i mean i'm i'm half spanish so my my spanish grandmother you try to sell a spanish person to stay indoors for one day and you've got a complete panic on your hands let alone two months you know my spanish grandmother will uh is 86 years old on one one stroll around the block, which is all she can manage these days. She probably kissed the cheeks of like 20 people. You know, that's her daily stroll. So yeah, absolutely. It's selecting for certain traits, this virus. Um, what it also does is emphasize the viral qualities of capitalism. Alan was talking earlier, I think about kind of the, the imbecilic nature. You know, I call capitalism a form of viral stupidity. 
And it's really exposing that viral stupidity. Of course, capital has viral qualities. There's a lot of writing on that. Um, but what I think we do need to speak a little bit more about, and this is something that um, David Roden brought up earlier, is ecology. And I think that these ecological externalities that can't price in um, mean that uh, a politics fit to the contemporary moment has to grapple with the ecological implications of the dismantling of capitalism, which will amount to, uh, in my view, an exercise in eco-logistics. What I mean by that is a kind of mobilization of ecological forces, uh, coordinated or not. Uh, you don't need to narrativize it uh, necessarily. David, David spoke about this as well. The ecological resilience has no kind of ethical narrative. And that's why we, we struggle to bring it in line with a kind of rationalist politics of any sort. At the same time, we have to grapple with it. I think uh, the adequate framework for grappling with it is not as someone like Davos spoke about left accelerationism, but it's inhumanism. You have to grapple with inhuman at this point in history in a way that we haven't had to before. And we have to look to those black scholars. We have to look to those scholars of the inhuman, uh, not just to kind of cite in some kind of academic exercise, but to uh, truly um, uh, take on the challenge, and it's a kind of an impossible challenge, of understanding the human subject position. And this is an impossible challenge that is also a challenge of a generation. Uh, how do we uh, cognize uh, the inhuman? Uh, and I would suggest it has to be through the lens of ecology, that is, in a systematic way. I talk about ecologics. It is in a way that is open to the scientific modeling of uh, the laws that underpin systems of interdependent variables. And I think we have to keep that in the frame. We have to keep all of this in the frame, incredibly difficult thing to do. Take everything from the theory of Sylvia Winter uh, through to you know, the technical aspect of ecological modeling to forge a new politics. And what's really interesting for me here is there are some very fine lines between some really nasty politics, what I would call eco-fascism, and some really uh, you know, li liberatory kind of capacities of what one might call eco-socialism. And this is what, not our generation, the generation under us are starting to grapple with, uh, primarily through uh, ecological and environmental activism, where I see a lot of energized people under the age of 25 uh, already involved. Um, but this, this, this kind of, this kind of uh, biotic front in this war between ecological thinking and ecological laws and capital has caught us kind of by surprise in its temporal nature, but it's part of a broader war. And we have an abiotic rear guard here, which is immense and is gonna make this look like a little blip. Uh, we have this huge wave coming up. We can spot it, it's behind this, this small crest of the virus, and it's, it is the abiotic rearguard and what these things have in common is they're ecological. Uh, and I think that's what people like me, or that's what I'm grappling with. How can we think through this without sinking into, I don't know, some kind of Timothy Morton narrative. Now, uh, uh, Davor and David and others have talked about apocalypse and have talked about um, kind of, this is quite interesting to me because this is a very Western idea. I mean, the, the West really like, has a fetish for singularities. I'm sorry, but you guys really just like, you know, really grasp onto singularity scenarios. You love catastrophes. Now, if you zoom out from a singularity, you well, know, this far is enough. We also include Islam in Western, but Islam to Iran is the West. So well, I'm have... speaking as the Indian in the room. So, you know, and I'm speaking as an Indian who's a rationalist, not some new age hippie because that's a Western framing of what I would say when you zoom out of a singularity far enough, you find a cycle, essentially. And it's a very discomforting truth to think that humanity itself might just be part of a broader cycle. And that is the kind of uh, inconvenient truth that I'm interested in grappling with when I talk about AI. And I think that's where discourses on things like AI give you a little hook Onto, in which you can think about this broader, broader context of the, uh, at the species level. Um, but as I say, these are the things I'm grappling with, I don't have answers to them. I find myself continually vigilant 
of slipping into a kind of uh, very easy eco-fascist narratives because, you know, my humanism is sympathetic to two ideas about humanity, which are, you know, quite close to eco-fascist ideas about uh, the ecophagy that capital unleashes on our ecosystem. It's, it's literally ecocidal attempt to annihilate all life on the planet, and that's us. Uh, we can't put it down in the right wing manner to some kind of external agent that we can call capital. No, you can't naturalize capital as a get out clause for what is essentially a normative political social problem. You know, I call it a human virus, capital. And I think Super this conflation of capital and human, which is the right wing, is the Landian approach, is something that we really need to push back on. And I think it's really been exposed by what's just happened. You know, capital has been confronted by actual uh, inhuman uh, logics and is collapsing uh, because it doesn't have that ecological resistance uh, and resilience that David was talking about. And we, this exposes some of those false narratives we see on the right that are so suggestive to the eco-fascist kind of trend, which if we're not cap careful, will uh, take hold of a whole generation of young people. I know, I Thank you so much, Anna. Yeah. Can I ask I think a we should question? Let Andre also I, I, think, I think at this point we should minimize the interventions until uh, yeah, we are done. Yeah, yes. exactly. Thank you so much, Anil, for a magnificent presentation. And I am sure your great comrade in chief, Andre, is going to top it up. We certainly have our favorite people in the room. <laughs> Hi, thank you. Everyone, it was, a, it was a great afternoon. I've been all, almost on the beginning. Uh, do you hear me? Uh, yes, absolutely. Go right, ahead. Right. Okay. So uh, I want to make a couple of points. Uh, the first one is about um, uh, a concept of work. I think it's uh, I'm coming mostly from politically from a value form criticism school of thought. And I think that this, this virus, uh, um, so this epidemic will, shows a couple of contradictions uh, that I think will, will follow us from, for the next whatsoever many years, uh, which is a, that uh, many in, uh, more optimist accelerationists uh, would say that the automation is a salvation of us all. It will, alienation and the new second nature this bull by this will save us all. But with all the automation, if you shut down, you still have a huge crisis. If you shut down work, if you send people home, you still have a major, have major issues. Uh, and this shows uh, um, the fact that you do have right now, after the crisis of Fordism, uh, work that is both obsolete, but also absolutely necessary. Uh, because, as, as it follows from the, the exchange and value and trade still are based on a, co a certain cost of labor. A labor that is increasingly obsolete uh, in the economy. The problem, the problem that I believe will follow, uh, to keep this short, uh, is that you will have, um, as most of the times in uh, post-war history, that uh, the states, the big business, they always draw the right conclusions. Uh, in the sense of for them, in in the sense that a new uh, a new wave uh, of precarization of layoffs of uh, um, destroying social safety that will will follow, uh, but not uh, as I believe will not come a certain kind of um, post or even further movement beyond the UBI or from the, will come from the left. Now this, uh, because as, as I don't see the crisis mostly as a, as a chance for um, um, social coagulation or coalition building is mostly because as I've seen in the media in the last couple of days, a new concepts or older concepts uh, of um, mass are coming to the fore. And I've been reading a lot of Ishai Landa lately. Uh, if you know the author, he wrote, I believe, uh, Paradigm Changer History book on uh, uh, liberal tradition, The Last Man, an interpretation of Nietzsche, uh, where he talks uh, about, and I found this very interesting because I see this kind of narrative in the media in the last couple of days, um, that um, by 
is isolating people by sending people in quarantine. Um, you have this kind of um, reporting from the outside world, where even the park uh, across the corner becomes the outside world, uh, becomes the sort of reporting, uh, a reporting that uh, comes with this sort of uh, National Geographic everyday life uh, studies. And this brings uh, a concept of the irrationality of other people. The irrationality of other people comes uh, in journal articles, comes in the news, uh, which generates a certain concept of um, uh, old school uh, despising of, uh, of, the social, of the social body. Which, in my, which following uh, people like Ishai Landa who look back on reporting of Ernst Jünger, for example, of old uh, fascist authors, uh, you see this kind of uh, this destruction of possible coalitions uh, that can be built uh, against the obsolescence of work. Uh, and this, uh, this is to be seen also uh, and this I, I will um, leave for the moment for, with that. You see this also in the reaction of, of Alain Badiou. Also this kind of despising of, of protest movements that have been that, that uh, he believes to uh, be causes and not responses to the crisis. When, when he says that, when he attacks the religion, when he attacks uh, trade unions, you see also this kind of, this kind of despising, despising coalitions that, that come in time of crisis. Uh, and when he says this is war, uh, when he says things like this is war, um, one one could say, okay, but has been before has has there been, has there been peace? Uh, has there been a social uh, um, normality? Uh, and if you uh, and I, the last the last thing I would like to uh, to call the last author is that. Uh, Fa German fascist sociologist Werner Sombart, uh, who also said like exactly like Badiou, this is war. He goes back. He goes back to a concept. Uh, the first wage laborer is the soldier, as the, also the English the etymology of the English language says. Uh, Werner Sombart looks at the first uh, wage laborer is the soldier, and he draws the conclusion that capitalism is this kind of economy war economy in time of peace. And he, uh, not like Bad, you would say that in the times of war, uh, we have to block capitalism, what Macron does or what politicians do today, state interventionism, socialism, is this kind of res response of capitalist economy in times of war. It's exactly the other way around. Uh, Go ahead. No, uh, I was. Um, what's right? I, I think with, with this um, idea. Oh, okay. So Reza, do you want to like? Do you want to like respond to uh, Andre? You're muted. Hi. Uh, uh, hello. I think that you haven't got any haircuts. From the past few no, weeks. I haven't. Sorry. Sorry. Yes. Okay. Good. Uh, the barber closed. <laughs> yes, I know that. <laughs> so I just wanted. Uh, I actually want to uh, kind of, uh, you know, kind of compress something that has come up uh, in the past uh, lectures from early on, uh, and shoot it at you, uh, knowing that you are among the greatest Hegelian scholars that I know. So, um, do you really think that you can harvest an opportunity from catastrophe? Um, yes and no. Uh, first, so the problem, uh, the problem of, um, of catastrophe or, or crisis is that um, it's not, um, it's rarely, you know, exogenous. Uh, that the question that one should uh, should ask how much how much 
transparency is there in a system to view uh, that which uh, translated the possible exogenous event in its own language, its own structure. Uh, and I think, um, I think that in our situation, you have this um, kind of glimpse of a real possibility of uh, an economy of peace, of seeing in this shutdown a chance for uh, uh, how would be a, a slowing down of life beyond illness and uh, isolation. I think that the possibility is there to see something. Um, I don't think that we have the means uh, to formulate the right negation at this moment uh, that would translate uh, this fragility uh, system in something in something else. Um, as I see more and more uh, these sort of old tropes, uh, conservative critiques of uh, mass reaction, for example, of, sure. uh, you see, in the case in the in the in the case of hoarding, that nobody believes it, but every everybody does it. Uh, and this uh, toilet paper <laughs> uh, thing. Um, so, thank you. Yes. So that was a perspective, the perspective uh, vector. Uh, now, we can also ask uh, about a kind of uh, retroactive vector. That what do you think uh, the current crisis uh, would lead to? Uh, you see, um, as I mentioned, that um, there is a quite a good possibility at this point that the crisis will cripple not just capitalism but all sorts of emancipatory forms of mobilization or action or collective action. What do you think about uh, that scenario? Mm. Not just about what will happen, but what is happening will do to what has already happened. Um, so you do have a lot of rewriting of history. Uh, if you look at, at, especially at conservative authors these days, uh, that's for example, has been this article today about uh, how great the uh, sure the Merkel era was in hoarding resources for to employ them at the current time. Um, if I um, if I if if this crisis is to look at if to look at the past, uh, one could say that um, this is just one step that will to be not completely pessimistic, uh, some form of um, rewriting, rewriting of the collapse of the last 30 years in a sense that a possible, that what, what capitalists can offer us at, the, at this moment is only the Hobbesian, the Hobbesian uh, uh, inferno. Carries a disease, inferno, yes. only the Hobbesian inferno. And what I believe that uh, in this um, truth moment, Christ, that is that exactly uh, it shows it shows many people that the future is just an offer that you have to refuse. As it's kind of coming back in eugenic eugenistic policies like in Britain, or uh, this kind of hopes uh, uh, or of everybody against everybody. If I may ask you a third question. Mm. If I can bother you with that. Yeah, sure. So uh, uh, with regard, I, I'm sure that you have read Badiou's piece. Uh, yes. Yeah, I know that you will. <laughs> Just the moment it's getting published. <laughs> yeah. yes. uh, so with regard to, uh, you know, as, as, a, as a context uh, for the question, uh, then there is also a third way uh, which would be fundamentally a skeptic, a la Hegelian a skepticism, <coughs> an alternative. But precisely because, as you said, that we do not have the means of determinate negation, we can't either go through a fundamental meltdown, as some accelerationists would hope for, nor 
can we rewrite our history? Andre, can yes. I ask you a question that builds on Reza's? It's like a part two to it because it has to do exactly with what Reza's last clause asked. Um, and perhaps you can address both of them together. Uh, Reza, I want to just say, you keep mentioning this about your piece. I want to just say he makes a grave error just biologically. The R yes, I, I mean, I uh, just don't, 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 don't trust any philosopher when it comes to biology. Unless yeah, but like it's, it's fully no educated. Of R noughts, R noughts deal with how viruses, uh, you know, proliferate. Uh, SARS had 1.4 to 1.6 uh, H1N1, and uh, COVID. No, I mean, uh, you can, you can, I mean, you can, you can, you can read. I mean, what is better journal? Uh, I mean, the most prestigious journal than Lancet. Uh, if you read uh, from the unfolding. Uh, moment of uh, end COVID-19, you see that there are really great pieces by written by great virologists and epidemiologists who are talking about this. So what is exactly uh, differentiate COVID-19 from something like AIDS, from old pandemics, from SARS, from uh, you know, uh, the Middle Eastern coronavirus, so on and so forth. Well, there is a, a lot that distinguish this from such things. It is not just SARS-2. It is not an updated version of SARS. You see, from a biological perspective, just add one spike protein to a DNA sequence of an already entrenched virus. And the whole thing can change. The whole game will change. The particle is also 0 0.003 micro. Uh, well, so you see that, that there is, there is something small. in epidemiology, uh, uh, security analysts, system engineers, and epidemiologists call R not. It's That's a what I just said. I said it's 2.2. This this COVID is 2.2. The median, the median average, the median average, the median average of COVID-19 is two plus versus SARS. It's the Which median average. The median average is based on the first cases that has been provided to CDC and WHO. It might be far higher. The median average is actually, it's just like what you might call to be in a system scenario, the best case scenario. Yeah, I think we should all read a bit more epidemiology in, in theory world. Um, and okay, I will, I will highly suggest reading this just uh, it is, it's a, 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 I don't want to uh, waste time of Andre and other people, but I actually suggest uh, this uh, Lancet uh, uh, essay, uh, which was published uh, at the onset, almost at the onset of the coronavirus. Um, uh, it is called, uh, my apologies, one second. It is called, um, can we contain the COVID-19 outbreak with the same measures as for SARS is written by Annalise Wilder-Smith. So Andre, please go on. Oh, yes, uh, regarding your question. Um, so the problem, uh, the problem that I, the problem that I see, for example, in, um, philosophical responses to this, because I, I don't think that philosoph philosophy has actually the tools to negotiate uh, this, kind of, this kind of problems. Uh, but uh, I, think, I think that reaction from, uh, from philosophers are instructive for a certain kind of reflexes that are there in, the so in society when dealing with things that you don't actually understand. So we need the uh, reflexes, but not necessarily the content of the reflexes. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> uh, I am I am very much sure that I know less uh, biology than Agamben or Badiou together, or every each one of them. Uh, but what is interesting? Global coronavirus. 
Uh, but what I uh, what I see uh, the first time the first time I read his text, I was depressed. I was depressed by the fact that okay, this guy understood that this this situation is actually the new normal. That the reaction of the state is the only possible reaction of the state. The, um, the reaction of people is the only possible one. And I was completely depressed because I think the most depressing truth about this crisis is not that we are in some sort of state of exception, but it, because it's, it w is and will be boringly normal from now on, or as already been, but we didn't know this. Um, the second part is exactly getting this dynamic wrong of, of thinking about this kind of events in a normalcy against a state of exception, which I think it's both the mistake of Agamben and, and of uh, Badiou uh, in the opposite direction. Um, and in this sense, uh, I think that um, if, you, if you follow the, the, the uh, long Marxist tradition, which Badiou brutally departs from in that text, is to see that the history of capitalism, the history of constant exception, constantly revolutionizing itself, and creating an aspect of normalcy. Uh, and exactly, exactly this problem, uh, his, his text mistakes, of, um, is actually as, um, um, and you do have an, a normalcy that, and if you read this together with the Agamben one, which is in my opinion, even maybe worse, uh, is to say- uh, is to It's say worse. That, thank you. <laughs> um, is to say that, uh, while I get the most more general point that you cannot do uh, politics only surrounding the idea of survival, uh, that you have a decay of politics that in the end is just of this kind of survival, policing of survival of the bodies of, of life. Uh, but again, this, this sort of normalcy against state of exception is very inaccurate uh for this kind this kind of this kind of crisis in my opinion awesome thank you very much so me and reza and valentine have been here from 4 30. so <laughs> maybe we would allow people who haven't spoken like maybe katarina wants to say something i, I think katarina left didn't she no she's here i can see katarina oh, okay. She went and walked and she's back, right? If Beautiful. I got it right. Well, Alan had a good question for Katerina that now that she's back, maybe. Yes, actually there was some conversation going on here which which Katerina missed, right? So maybe 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 that can conclude the, conclude our program. No, uh, I'm sorry, but I haven't been following. I just came back and um, I've been arguing with uh, another group on a different topic. So I'm just... Oh, Are you yeah. double zooming? No, I'm fighting with people online <laughs> about the new restrictive measures of, uh, you know, uh, movement. So I haven't followed. I, maybe somebody, if somebody else could comment and then I can build on I would love Alan. To, to and to have the final word, sorry, because like, I just think yeah. okay. and it, I mean, you should rewind the tape and watch Alan's segment because it really spoke to what you, what you talked about. So mm -hmm. too bad that you had to walk your dog before the curfew, right? Yeah. So, and Mohamed, this is recorded? And then, yes, yeah. of course. Okay. Alan asked if it was recorded, so I just want to make sure. Yes, that... yes Alan, it's recorded. Where, how do we access the recording? You will, it, it'll be public on YouTube. And we actually are thinking of doing like a highlights. We're like, we're going to like do like a highlights and do like a, maybe like a half an hour one with like concentrated stuff and to cut out some of the, some of the other stuff. But the, but the whole thing will be available as soon as we finish. It's public on our page and it's a top video. And we can even send you the link plus with Davor's uh, presentation, the slide presentation. I, I did have a, a question for Katharina. I was just asking, you know, uh, hope, hoping that she, you know, had, as someone who, myself, who taught in Central European University and in uh, Ljubljana during the 1990s uh, and came in contact with uh, Sharna Papic, the Serbian feminist and sociologist, who was probably murdered by the Milosevic regime, uh, had this uh, concept called the fascization of everyday life. 
which he applied, uh, which applied to the lead up of, of the, uh, the breakup of Yugoslavia. Uh, but I think what we're, we're seeing now in, in terms of state responses to the Corona uh, situation. So that, that was only the kind of a reference or a footnote. But, uh, but this issue, I mean, fascization of everyday life is basically for Joanna a mediatic with is occurring not on not only the level of the state, but at the level of, of the media and, mm-hmm. and, uh, and at, at micro levels, you know, it's, it's not, not the level of superstructure, but the level of micrologic mm-hmm. uh, everyday life structures and practices. You know, and it goes, oh, I, 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 now I understand what the question was, yeah. The question about subject, you were raising the issue about subjectification, right? Mm-hmm. Questioning Agamben's model. And basically my, my response was that who, you know, of course I am also influenced by Derrida's discussion on political animality, that who or what uh, becomes a subject is always open to question. Uh, and that I, I would argue that based on my experience working on HIV AIDS, and, and, uh, and writing about the stratification of immune systems that occurred in the United States at that point and what type of populations were seen as stigmatized and disposable based on uh, their, uh, their alleged or imputed compromised immune system that the, the new political subject is the immune system which mediates or interfaces between the virus and our sense of selfhood. Uh, and this is what's going to be addressed. Uh, the manipulation or instrumentalization of the immune system is going to be, has already been attempted to be addressed by uh, Boris Johnson in his uh, application of herd immunity, and also by Trump, who wants to restart capitalism uh, in another couple of weeks so he can salvage uh, large scale corporations uh, while sacrificing certain age groups to uh, contamination by the virus. Mm-hmm. And I was citing the book, you know, who comes after the, the famous book about who, who comes after the subject. And I would, my answer now would have been uh, uh, contrary to uh, uh, what's his name. Um, uh, I forget him. Never mind. I, my answer was the, the immune system is what comes after the subject. And I think we have to remember that Foucault's definition of subjectification is that power is always an action upon the action of the of the other. Right, it's always an mm-hmm. action. It requires agency. So, uh, and there's also the uh, the famous book by uh, Jean Luc Nancy on on the intruder, right, which was about his heart transplantation, mm-hmm. but where he talks about the uh, the immune system as not really repelling difference, boys in search of difference. So, mm-hmm. we don't control our immune systems. They they exist halfway between ourselves and. And the and the ecosystem in which we are, are our habitat, you know, and are mediating our relationship to the virus. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, Alan. So we really need to wrap it up. Reza already excused and is gone because he had to be somewhere. Mm-hmm. Um, I just wanted to thank thank everyone. Tons of people came in and brought interesting points to the table. Just remember that this program is going to be weekly. I know. Uh, I know uh, Eric wanted to ask more questions from Davor. There were like things that uh, Ekin wanted to bring up, but we're going to do this weekly and it's going to rotate between different hosts. This week was me and Valentina and Reza, but it's going to be pretty much organized in the same manner. And we're going to like reach out to people outside of the new center and ask people who want to come in and say, because this is a developing catastrophe, right? And new data will require new reflections and understanding and analysis, right? So. This is, not the, this is not a one-time event. We're going to have it regularly on Wednesdays at 5 p.m. It might not last three hours and a half or four hours, but actually it's four hours and a half now. But it would last at least a couple of hours. So a lot of the stuff, we can pick up these threads, bring some of the people who had important things to say to highlight their point in a, in a more formalized manner. And yeah, so, and really this was like initiated from, from basically the idea was initiated by the student of the news center and Valentin and one of the, researchers who've been with us and he'll be teaching a seminar with us very soon and i'm so glad that that these people all uh, came up with this idea and we're gonna we're gonna do it every week so thanks everyone thank you very much for sticking around for four and a half hours and yeah and basically the link will be available to share and also davor please don't forget to share with us your presentation so i can share it with alan and the rest of the people who are want to see more like those small font words that you had in your cones 
or in your projections or whatever you call them. Thank you, Francis. Thank you, Katerina. Thank you, Andre, for waiting so long. And th let's also thank Castro. You want to turn your camera on because Castro has been like VJing this from behind the scene, right? Sitting in front of me and kind of like making sure. Hello, guys. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so that's what it is. They can hear you from here. Yeah, yeah. No, you could speak there and they can hear you here, uh, but that's totally fine. You yeah. can do either way. Yeah, so thank you so much, everyone. And yeah, let's hope mm -hmm. that let's hope that some of the more positive and more emancipatory outcomes that we imagine out of this crisis will actually materialize rather than the darker ones and and further catastrophic ones. Um, you, uh, yes, send, go ahead. You also send emails of the participants. Yes, absolutely. We're gonna keep everyone close and so you can share your emails and maybe share thoughts. And Alan have an upcoming seminar with us called Guarding the Borders, which is so pertinent to what's happening right now. And uh, Andre has a seminar coming up with us. And hopefully Katarina will, every time I ask Katarina to teach, she's like, I just taught my last core book. Leave me alone. I have nothing to teach right now. I just want to like breathe. So basically, yeah. And hopefully Francis would also take up our challenge of teaching some seminars for us soon. And yeah. And thanks again for everyone who made Thank this Thank you, Mo. Thank you. This was brilliant. Yeah, this is all we can do, right? Thanks. Yeah, thank thanks. you. Thanks. <laughs> Bye. Bye -bye. Bye, bye. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Uh, write me if there's any news. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you, Alan. Thank you, as always.